Hey, welcome to Sense Episode 88. It's March 19th, 2017. Welcome to the show that never ends, or actually it might. More on that later. But this is a live on Doctor News show we do here at Dollar Reviews. We cover everything that's happened over the last seven days in terms of technology, TV, movies, streaming, video games, and most importantly, VR. Because that's the thing that I care about the most, and I'm the one that runs the show, so... What I care about is what matters. My name is Brian Gillis. You can follow me on Twitter, but more importantly than me is the show itself. It's Dollar Reviews, dollarreviews.net. On Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if you can think of it, we're there. Even Tumblr, barely. Should probably use that more, but I'm lazy. Um, but as I said, I am B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S. I'm on all of those great things, too. Don't send me a friend request on Facebook unless you're a weirdo. Instagram totally works, though, and I'm not alone because talking about myself is literally what makes you crazy. I'm here with Stephen Mominex. So yeah, no shame there, but I'm sorry. So they have to be crazy to Facebook friend you? Like, Yeah, if I don't know someone and you send me a friend request and the message says, hey, you don't know me, but I'll listen to your podcast. Can we be friends? Just by default, you got to? I got to not, actually. Um... You don't think that's not weird? No, I, I think that is weird. That's that, okay. definitely not a double negative there. Yeah, nah. Like, follow me on Instagram or, or or Twitter, anything where there isn't a privacy wall. Yeah, but do you really want to know? But did I hear you phrase this wrong? I thought you said that if they were crazy, then you'll probably accept it. No, no. When when it's tired, it. okay. you're tired. You're yeah. very tired. Uh, I'm gonna start yeah. the show off with a couple of retractions really quick. Uh, this is the first time I've done this because I. I, I, maybe I published a little too quickly last week. Uh, two things, the first of which is a lot less serious than the second one. Uh, late Shift, it's a, a thing that I was talking about is on PlayStation upcoming on PS4. It's a cool like a uh, choose-your-own-adventure interactive movie-slash-TV show. Um, I claim that it was only on PS4. It isn't. It's actually multi-platform. It's going to be on Xbox One as well. And more importantly, it premiered first on iOS, and it's already there already. You can download it for $5, and it even had a theatrical run. The thing that is important, though, and it also carried its name into the title, um, it was, uh, was it non-sexism is the new sexism? <laughs> uh, in our conversation about the F rating, which has been adopted by IMDb to rank things that show, well, it's a three-step thing. Mm-hmm. One, it's written and directed by a woman. Two, it's, star, it's central figures are women, or it has an intrinsically female story and there's the F rating for one of those three things and a triple F if it does all three it's notable because Camera Person which is going to be our next all our views episode is a triple F feature it's on Amazon Instant Prime and we're going to be watching it this week Um, I claimed and I was kind of upset about how this rating works i was under the impression because i didn't do my research that it'd be like a big sticker on the the web page kind of like the actual ratings are that indicate what it is it did no, sound no. like that like you go on the page that, and it would be pasted it, on there like exactly. that's, the title and everything that's what i thought it was it yeah. isn't what it actually is is a lot less uh, intru- uh in, intrusive it's very tame if you go on imdb and you go into the search field and you change it from title to keyword and you search for F word, I mean F rating, it pops up and you can look by by year, by genre, by uh, how popular it is, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I found lots of cool things in there. There was a section where I, I took a screenshot because it was like Clueless, Mean Girls, and 13 Going on 30 or something like that. I was like, <laughs> awesome, I love those movies. Um, uh, the thing that I did have a problem with, and I think this is something that's going to change over time, uh, and it's because uh, just inherently how they derive the rating it's from the Bechdel test so most of the people that take that test or it's submitted to are women so they're they have a natural bias and I was talking about in our criticism of the not just the rating itself but its adoption on IMDB which is now a lot less uh, scary that John Hughes probably didn't make the cut and sure enough he didn't make the cut not Mr. Mom not 16 Candles not Pretty in Pink uh, which is very weird because most women that grew up in the 80s uh, would probably pretty much say that Molly Ringwall framed who they were as an adolescent. <laughs> so maybe change your rating. It's a piece of shit. Uh, but we're going to find out for real because we are going to watch one in a couple of days. Uh, but here's the real stuff. Here's some teasers. We're going to start some superhero things so we can get your, wet your palate. Uh, and if you like these news points, stay after Penny Thoughts or quick reviews of things we did this week. And we're going to be talking about similar things in the headlines that really deserve much more attention. I don't want to feel rushed. So the first one is about Superman, not the actual movie, but the actor 
character. Henry Cavill is going to jump ship, do another franchise. He already did The Man from Uncle, so why not try another TV adaptation? He's going to be joining Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 6. Uh, that's all we know about the film. Is he on the uh, team, or is he going to be a villain? I, I don't know. I hope he's the villain. That would be cool. That would be awesome, yeah. That uh, would be really cool, because... Uh, yeah, he hasn't played against type. Even when he was first getting into Hollywood and shit like the Immortals, he's always been the hero. <laughs> yeah. So it, it would be really cool if he was the villain. Um, hopefully, because, I mean, it's a stacked team already. You got Alec Baldwin, you got Jeremy Renner, uh, Ving Rhames, shit. Um, they I don't know, how many that... of them would be coming back? Because Ving Rhames sat it out Simon for the fourth Peg. one, and he was just there for a cameo. So. I'm pretty sure they're all going to come back because... At least be featured, probably, but they don't. they're not always there. I, I'm fairly certain that Alec Baldwin, Jeremy Renner, and also uh, well, who's the new girl that just got added that's in everything Rebecca now? Rebecca Ferguson. She's probably going to show up, too. Yeah. But all that matters is it's Tom Cruise. The uh, Chris McQuarrie is also writing directing this one. It's in pre-production. It already has that VR thing in production as well at Paramount. We're probably going to get a teaser for this later this year. I wouldn't be surprised if we maybe get like a little teaser by the time uh, The Mummy comes out just to capitalize on Tom Cruise being on the mm -hmm. big screen again. Yeah. Uh, but that's just conjecture. Either way, pretty exciting, especially because when you are Superman, you kind of get pigeonholed into that role. <laughs> uh, you can look through through history. I mean, uh, look, Even Brandon you, Routh, and that was his first mm -hmm. movie at that point, and he's yeah, only he's... known as the guy that was Superman. Not anymore. A lot of people know him as the Adam in the CW Arrowverse. Like he's pretty popular for that, especially in TV circles. And I've See, seen episodes I, with him, and he's good. I don't know that, but I'll there's, take your word for it. There's this actual funny joke that happens. Uh, I'm not caught up on the Flash, but I did see the four show crossover, the Invasion um, hybrid event, and there's this moment where um, it's like Supergirl just like finished her mission. She's back in her her human uh, like you know, makeup and her get up to, to appear like she's one of us. Mm -hmm. And she walks right by Brandon Routh and he's like, I have a cousin that looks just like her. <laughs> and it's like, ha ha ha, like a Supergirl is Superman's cousin. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, that's, that's funny. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sad about this movie. You can go listen to our review for Mission Impossible 5, Rogue Nation. <laughs> we didn't have the best things to say. If I remember cor correctly, we both fell asleep. <laughs> uh, we were, I don't know. I, I was definitely tied on my screening. We were both just kind of like, oh, you know, this is cool, but for some reason, it just doesn't feel awesome. Yeah, I, like, I there's, mean... Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there, and then I'm like, why am I so underwhelmed? I should really be enjoying this. I sporadically wear an IMF pin, especially yeah. at work. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, but other than that, yeah, I don't really have anything to say about that. Movie. Yeah, well, like it's I said, on Amazon you... Prime, and I mean, a lot of people, uh, well, one of my friends has rewatched it, and they just said they enjoyed it more the second time. So, you know, maybe it's one of those. All, all I, I remember know. was that, like, I, I remember falling asleep during the opera sequence, which is what everyone can shut up about. I the love thing that, that sequence. I, I really love the motorcycle chase. You felt you like you were going 100 miles per hour yeah. in the movie theater. That was awesome. That was that was really good. I like the um, plane thing, but then again, everyone did when it was in all the advertisements. It, yeah, but, it was. But it that was, was at least season. smart that they made that that first sequence because yeah. everyone was going to – they already knew what the punchline for that was, so yeah. – uh, moving on, though, here's a different superhero thing. It might not be the publicity that Lionsgate is looking for, but one of the past Power Rangers confessed he stabbed his roommate with a samurai sword back in 2015 this week. <laughs> he's going to be serving six years in county. Of course, he's a celebrity, so it's going to be a lot less, and that's down from what I think was like 12 or something. This is an investigation that's lasted over two years, mm -hmm. but that's just crazy. Like, do you think it's not going to hurt box office? I don't think it, not at all. If anything, it actually helped it in kind of the same way well, that I'd, I think a lot of people like, you know, or no one's really talking about it. So it'll probably just because like this is not really a celebrity. This is someone from a show that's it's what, part of an ensemble years old right now. Like it's it's not. not even well, he's in one of the remake. later series. Like I think he's in uh, he's in the Samurai one, the and also like one. Dino Rangers or yeah. some shit. You know, past our age limit. Uh, speaking of though, I watched some of the marathon on Twitch this week. Yeah, it's so fucking campy. Like it's even <laughs> it, it's entertaining today. Um, just how whimsical it is and over the top and the ADR and just the makeup. Like it's it's a fun time. Like yeah. I, I, I would definitely I seriously look am into going Thursday night. Like it. It will be a good crowd, I guarantee I didn't you. think I, I would be that nostalgia-stricken by this, but then just, like, seeing even trailers for this new one, it's... 
I think it's just the idea of some something like that that's awesome. Like, you know, when you're watching, like, superhero movies as a kid, you watch Spider-Man or Batman or Superman, and, you know, uh-huh. there's part of you that, like, wants to be that. But then with Power Rangers, it's like, that's the closest one where you're pretty close to what their age is, or you know that that'll be coming at some point. Spider-Man. Like, well, yeah, the, uh, that too. Spider-Man. That too, but, I mean, I, I guess there was that sense too. But then, I don't know, because Power Rangers was a show... You know, that was like something you could tune in like yeah, go, every week. Go. So that nostalgia factor was you, a lot stronger. Check back now. They do not look like they're in high school. They look older than I look currently. They just don't have facial they, hair. They're they, all fucking kid, swole working out. That stuff. Like I, I've seen people on the internet. They're like, I don't get it. Why do the Power Rangers now have powers when they're not in costumes? Like, no, go look at some video clips <laughs> or some just like snapshots of the cast back then when they're not in outfit. They're yeah. all fucking swole. Like, no, they're working out. This is the 90s. Uh, <laughs> but what's crazy about this, you know, Max Landis, he wrote the script that, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't get purchased. Part of that, I think, is the tone. He wrote it like the Power Rangers, and they wanted Chronicle, but it, with actual power, like a real superhero movie version of Chronicle. So I have this feeling like this is actually going to be a super serious, very gritty fairly dark film that isn't fun and it might tank because of that reason so i hope it stays true to the source material and it is campy but i highly doubt it and i'm probably gonna see it fun from that trailer and you know i like project almanac um yeah me too you know even that that has that uh chronicle vibe to it but yeah like i i really hope that there's just that camaraderie with the cast that that movie has it'll it'll do well i think um just quality wise if that's the case and the, that is the impression i'm getting for the trailer is there should be some chemistry there so i hope it's good yeah anyone out there that's listening if you haven't seen project almanac and what's his name Diz, dean israelite dean israelite yeah yeah and you you're interested in what he's done before see project almanac really underrated found footage genre flick uh it's it's pretty much primer but you can actually digest it and it's fun yeah. I, it's it's a weird Paramount flick that, hey, they only made because Chronicle did well, and it's almost a better version of Chronicle, to be honest. Uh, um, I can't go that far. <laughs> I, I, oh, really I said Chronicle almost. Yeah. Almost. No, but yeah, I, mean, I think it's it, just because it's not serious. Like I think it's good in its own right, and it gets a lot of shit just because Michael Bay's name is on it. Which It gets a lot of shit because it's found footage and it isn't made by Blumhouse. Like, if they don't make it, no one cares, pretty much, which is weird. Like, micro budget, like... That's a whole different story. That's we could talk. That could be a movie fight. <laughs> um, this is interesting. Moving from superheroes to directors, who are kind of superheroes in their own right. Route One, the production company between behind Tallulah, the upcoming Circle film by James Pondholt, and also Colossal, which Nacho Villa Lobos directed. Mm-hmm. Yep, director two more for, weeks. Director for Time Crimes. Listen to that episode. See that movie. More importantly. I'm going to see Colossal in theaters. I already yeah, you, I am too. I, are, I already know. After Like, Simon Crime sold me. I was like, I, yeah, I, I want to see what this guy does in English. I'm very They're interested. They're almost sold out for just Thursday night screenings here. It's insane how much they've been promoting it. Anyway, Route 1, they just optioned the claim. It's a, a taken S thriller from Damon Chazelle. Yeah, the director who just won an Oscar gold. Um He's probably not going to be directing this thing because he's working on his Ryan Gosling, Neil Armstrong biopic at Universal. Mm-hmm. But um, who knows? They, they could you know, finish that because I think they want to release that this upcoming October or so. They're looking to do it this holiday, or, uh, th- this festival season already. Or not festival, I mean award season. Um, so if that is Fast Track, maybe, maybe he will get a work on this too. I, I got no clue. He but hasn't you can... worked in an executive producer capacity yet, has he? Not that Chazelle, I'm yeah, because he's of. just starting out. So yeah, like he he could on this one though. I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. he didn't. Maybe he even works on the film like on set as the writer, or maybe they just buy it and they try to leverage his name to get people to show up in the theaters. Which he's young enough, he has enough of a cult following, probably because of Whiplash and The La Land, mm-hmm. that would most doubtedly, undoubtedly work in his favor, or at least uh, Route One's favor. And Tallulah wasn't our favorite movie. We got a dollar reviews for that. It's on Netflix. But between the Circle and Colossal, they got a slate of things that I'm interested in. They they seem like they could be one of those up and coming little independent, uh, uh, what you call it, tribes that that puts out good shit, kind of like A24. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about Universal though, they might be going to space with Dan Trachenberg. Also, he uh, has a four quadrant flick codenamed Space Race over there. 
um, which might not actually be about the space race. I have a feeling like it might be something like Zathura. That'd be cool because four quadrant means it hits on all cylinders. It has international appeal. It's uh, blockbuster. It's kid friendly, and it works for like merchandising too. Um, so when <laughs> yeah. you use that with the universal name, merchandise specifically, that's the key yeah, indicator. Like, yeah, it, talking about merchandise, I was actually going to save this for a little later in the show, but I guess it's kind of a perfect segue. Uh, but Comcast, you know, the company that owns Universal and also Universal Studios, NBC, and all kinds of different stuff, um, they most also notably own Fandango and its series of web commerce. Uh, Fandango now for streaming, Flickster, they own Rotten Tomangos. Uh, I said Tomangos. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an awesome name. I should make that a website. Right Certified into Mango. Fresh all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they're going to be joining web commerce. It's going to be called Fandango Fan Shop. It's going to offer T-shirts, hats, candy, collectibles, all kinds of shit related to legacy titles and upcoming new properties. It's going to start already. I think the first big movie that's going to include is Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 2. So you're going to be able to get, like, an I Am Group T-shirt that they only have the design of. No name uh, – it's, I don't know yet if they're going to have stores in their theme parks. They'd be stupid if they didn't, or at the very least, maybe a, a shop <laughs> within the City Walk, either mm-hmm. in Orlando or Hollywood or both. Um, but it, that would, yeah, they'd be foolish if they didn't capitalize on that. Maybe kind of like go the Mondo route. Uh, yeah, get that's a special exactly poster what I was thinking. Yeah. Or like a special T-shirt. Like, you want to get this special Jurassic Park hat? You can only get it at the shop within Universal Studios by the Jurassic Park ride or on our website. I mean, that'd be nice for merchandise if people are actually giving a shit about what they put into it now. Like, that's part of the reason why people love Mondo is the designs, you know? Like, I mean, Disney's... They, they at least are something instead of just some Photoshop drivel that's being put out there. Yeah, Mondo and Disney are pretty much the only two big names that do that. But there's so many websites. It's like those shirt and day Disney, sites. Like, like, of course, they merchandise. But their designs, I mean, you look at the poster for Beauty and the Beast. It's just generic Photoshop. You know, it, it's not much. Well, they're not going to have some artsy-fartsy poster. By the way, did you see the Dark Tower poster? I have not. It looks awesome. Yeah. It, it's um, it's upside down. And on the bottom of the poster, you see uh, Idris Elba and this little kid. And then on the top, it's Matthew McConaughey. So if you flip the poster upside down, like uh, you can see it. Just, just search for it. it it's a cool-looking poster. It's immediately <laughs> interesting, even if you know close to nothing about the Dark Tower, because if you're not a Stephen King reader, you probably don't. Um, hopefully Sony can be successful at that. I mean, most of their slate last year pretty much failed, with the exception of Angry Birds and like Hotel Transylvania. I mean, Hotel Transylvania was two years ago. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, pretty much Angry Birds. Angry Birds and the Smurfs were like the only things that they had going last year. Um, the Smurfs come out? No, Smurfs is this year. Isn't Smurfs it? is this year. Yeah. They make so many animated movies. It's so hard to catch up. What's weird is that they have a uh, new Smurfs movie, but it's not the live it, yeah, action it's, thing. Yeah, it's so a I whole new Smurfs. Yeah. It's a reboot. Uh, oh, that's what they did. Last year they had Trolls. Um, well, they also had Sausage parties. so I guess yeah. Sony Animation is doing well. Oh, so Yeah, Sony Animation does yeah. really, really well. That's really what they got. Although, Which, then again, Sausage Party did well because they didn't pay people for that. So uh, That wasn't them. That was more... I think that was Sony Animation. I think that was like some... I don't know, who knows? Uh, I, I'm not it, a reporter in that respect, and that's an old story that, that no that one's talking about. to happen, that animators work their asses off on something, and then they don't get paid for it. Uh, at least they are still got jobs. I mean, Life of yeah. Pi got an Oscar win, and that studio was shut down before the Oscars even broadcast. Yeah. So there are worse things in the industry. Um, but, yeah, no, like Sony Pictures Animation, they've, they've always been solid. Uh, this year is going to be the time they really see if that works in, in between the Emoji movie. And then also I think they, they have maybe that Sly Cooper adaptations coming out this year also, uh, the, the Smurfs one. But besides Spider-Man, they really – the only thing they got banking on is uh, is like, yeah, it's like if, if Dark Tower doesn't do well, yeah. I mean <laughs> – then just I don't know, especially with Spider Man, what's going on there? Because I'm assuming you're talking about Venom. At That's some gonna point. that'll be a headline. That'll be after Penny. Okay, Thoughts. I'll wait. Um, I'll patiently yeah, wait. Same with directors for for another second here. Leo Carax, a name that you probably aren't familiar with, and I don't mean you, but I mean our listeners. Um, he's a very 
very under the radar French filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, his last film, Holy Motors, I think was in the 2011 or 2012 yeah, uh, award season. Seen. I haven't seen it either. It used to be on Netflix. I'm not sure if it is anymore. Um, it's supposed to be a really like impeccable uh, character piece. Um, I've actually seen something of his, though. I'm trying to remember which one it was. It was in a college course, European in cinema post-1960. I'm actually going to check his imdb right now to see which one it is because i just don't remember um but i have seen something of his uh and he's part of that group like with luc besson and um shit there's like another guy there that were all like in the same uh group of filmmakers in the the early 80s in france that kind of blew up in the in the independent circle I just typed in French on IMDb. What the <laughs> fuck? That's how you, that's like that's why talking and doing a podcast while typing at the same time is not the smartest thing to do. And well, yeah, I no, you just you usually phone. just leave it to the co-host to take over, and then you try to quickly just absorb what they're saying while also typing something else. Uh, yeah, I know the guy did the sequence of Tokyo. I don't know if you saw that, but oh, I saw Lovers on the Bridge, which that's was really it. good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. It has, uh, and who uh, else is there other than Luc Besson that came from France and did action films? One of his other films that's on Netflix is Mauvais Song, and it's kind of like it's supposed to be like an allegory for HIV that I'm interested in. Bad but song. It, yeah, he hasn't made much. Like pretty oh, much. No, 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 Bad Blood. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a, it, yeah, yeah. I think it's a translation for that. Um, yeah. I'm looking at how it's spelled. Yeah, and then there's Boy Meets Girl, which is his premiere. Um, there's the guy that did Metro. I, I know that's not Besson. Um, I saw that. I did not like it. I'm not talking about the Eddie Murphy movie. <laughs> Fuckers. I don't even remember that guy's name. I I was not a fan. It. I think it was actually Besson. But there. Yeah. There's yeah. like. There's like three or four of them, and I mean, Luke Besson's only one that is a breakthrough, like crossover success, and you know, just because of the kind of movies that he makes. Yeah, were better yet, universal produces. appeal mainly. Yeah. Um. But they were all people that were, like, inspired by Kyrie de Cinema and, you know, made artsy-fartsy shit. Uh, but, yeah, his next film is going to be starring Adam Driver, and it's going to be on Amazon. And it seems like that's all Adam Driver does because Patterson is the same deal. Um, <laughs> he's currently filming the, the man who shot Don Quixote or whatever that title is actually going to be called. So he's in that too. The um, Gilliam one, or? yeah, the Gilliams actually yeah. they started production this week yeah. on that, so and it still stars Adam Driver. Uh, yeah, so they well, promised we'll at see. Con this year that it'd be ready for next Con. It probably will because Terry Gilliam you know, doesn't sleep. Um, it'd be pretty crazy. Uh, last director for now until after the break though is Justin Lin, and this is staying with streaming. He's going to be making an L.A. SWAT team versus Black Panther flick. It's going to be streaming first. It's based on a real story about the first outing for any SWAT team. And it's about the police force going into the Black uh, Militant Group's L.A. headquarters and uh, stopping shit. I don't know. Pretty much sounds like a song increasing 13th or something like that meets SWAT. Um, mm. But I don't know. Uh, just That's exciting. That's a really big name. I mean, Justin Lin did... M- m- all like of the, the good. Big, he's yeah. the guy that brought back Fast and he, the Furious. Not even brought back. Made Fast and Furious what it is today. Well, yeah, uh, but, but I mean, it just injected it with new life. It's really Fast Five was the one where, like, uh, that one just changed everything. Yeah, I still haven't put it seen the way that they do. Star Trek Beyond. I don't know no, when I will. Probably when it probably when it hits cable. I think it's already well, hit cable. I think it'll it'll hit. Um, it's part of the Epic deal, isn't it? It'll probably hit Amazon like at some point I, this it, summer. It, I don't think this summer. I think it's going to hit Amazon like in the next week or two. Cause, really? Yeah, think about it. That only yeah, came out day like release date. I think didn't that only come happened. out like a week or two after X Men Apocalypse, and that's already on HBO. So no, that, no, that was like well, two months or something. Even still, it's going to be like, half, it's, yeah. it's going to be like a week or two. Either way, whatever it was, ninety days after the home video release date and. I like his stuff, I have no idea when that and is. that's yeah. just yet another big name of guys that are that have made blockbusters going to Netflix to potentially make a blockbuster, the first of which is going to be bright later this year. Mm-hmm. I think they're targeting a November release or December, and so if David Ayer can, can do uh, – he must have already done something if Justin Lin is joining up too. Um, and I'm sure in the weeks to come there's going to be someone else, someone else that's really big oh, yeah. going What's... there. And what's cool about it, like with Netflix at least, is that they're not focusing on temples. They're just letting people bring original visions. Like so far, that's what it seems like. I mean, just I saw the teaser for Bright, and really, what big studio would finance that? When you think about it, 
Mm. Like, how would they market that? I it doesn't seem like a surefire hit in theaters. It seems like something where you see that trailer on Netflix and people will be willing to give it a chance if they hear enough good things about it. I mean, if the action is good, it kind of seemed like a, a Warner Brothers movie to me, just in terms of what they've done with fantasy uh, properties. That's what it seems like to me. I That's probably what they're banking on, especially getting the Suicide Squad director to, yeah. to helm it. You got Will Smith starring in it. Hey, he was in Suicide Squad. Um, <laughs> we'll still but, yeah, I mean, we, we don't we don't know. I mean, you got a comic book writer, but I, I'm I hope did it's Max good. Did Max ever spell his thoughts on Suicide Squad, or did he just? Yeah, no. If every it? comic book movie that comes out, he he tweets about it, and then if he really didn't like it or really liked it, he does like a YouTube rant video also that I'm I generally he don't didn't watch because his. The guy that's directing his latest script is uh, the director. Yeah, I, of that I movie. doubt he said anything bad about yeah. it. Yeah, like he didn't even really have anything bad to say about Batman, Batman versus Superman. All I really remember was him criticizing Doomsday and that fight, and then yeah. more importantly, Same how how Lex Luthor is a hundred percent basically <laughs> someone doing a, a, like a pretty yeah. good version of Max Landis, which is funny because he has a story about Jesse Eisenberg doing it on the set of American Ultra for him because, hey, <laughs> he wrote that movie. Uh, but you, th- this is not the Max Landis show. You can go read his tweets. Uh, was it Up to My Knees? Um, I think it's Up to My Knees 79 on Instagram? Something like that. You can just uh, type Max Landis on Twitter. You can find the real guy. Up to My Knees. I'm sure um, he's, uh, he's verified. It's a verified account. I'm not sure if he is. I don't know. Most veri- I'm sure, I'm no, sure he uh-uh. is. to be verified, you have to have your handle as your real name. So he can't be verified. There, there's a rule there, I believe. Um, verified. Is he verified? He's verified. Yeah. They must have changed it, that rule. It, it, no, your handle doesn't have to be your real name. No. No. Uh, he, he has his real name on there anyway. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's pictures of him. Yeah, he's been on Twitter for a long time. That whatever the process was back then, because I know it's. It's different now that anyone can be verified as long as you got a picture of yourself and some other criteria. But, uh, yeah, he's been on Twitter for long enough now that I'm sure he doesn't even need to be verified. Mm-hmm. Well, talking about streaming, we're, we're just talking about Amazon, talking about Netflix. Um, mm-hmm. It's a sad moment that we're going to have to soon uh, say goodbye to the best Blu-ray player that ever ma- ha- was ever manufactured and also help bring Netflix into countless homes. The PlayStation 3, rumor has it, is going to cease production, at least in Japan, in the coming months. Uh, It's been in production for a little over 10 years now. Um, And, yeah, it's probably going to be put to pasture soon. I, without a doubt, predict by the time E3 rolls around in June that Sony is going to say, you know, you you lasted a long time. (laughs) Lots of people loved you. It was, it was a checkered past, but it's time to go. They already Give stopped. Give a few years, you're going to say goodbye to Blu-ray as well. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. It'll, UHD it'll still it's hasn't happen. got mainstream adoption. It's it's still Sony just barely put out their own UHD it's, Blu-ray player. It's so. kind of looked at as the laser disc of right now, though. It, I don't no. know if it's going to have that long a run. I own one, man. I own yeah, one. I know you do. I know you do, but I just don't know if it's going to last that long. Um, it's worth noting, too, that this has kind of been a long thing coming. First of all, Sony, for all of their PlayStation products, when it is produced, they give it, they, they say it directly. We're, it's a 10-year life cycle. The PS2 got a little bit longer than that. It was about 13 years. The PS3 is almost at 11 right now. The PS4 is undoubtedly going to get it. It's just their way of saying, hey, you don't have fear if you buy our product. We're not going to stop producing it. This is the people that were making Betamax until, uh, like, like 30 weeks ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you can listen to our episode, Beta to the Max. Um, uh, but also, PlayStation Now, their cloud gaming, it's losing support for that on PS3 come, I, I think it's August or, or July or something. So they've slowly been pretty much not announcing necessarily, but indicating that it's coming to an end. Uh, and it kind of makes sense because the Blu-ray player is super cheap, the cell processor is super expensive, and they don't make games for it anyway, despite the library being really extensive. Um, my PS3 is still in great condition. I used it this week. Uh, I'll be talking about that during Penny Thoughts. Um, so if you don't have a PS3, maybe you should go out there and get one. It, it literally, used to, but it broke. 
it literally is the best Blu-ray player on the market. Even it still. was. Even then still. my disc drive got shut down, so it, I was a little upset about that. I but. love that every one of my ever-growing 3D Blu-rays has a sticker on it on the back, or like better yet, not even a sticker, actually part of the box that says, play it in your 3D uh, Blu-ray yeah, player see, or PlayStation 3. <laughs> so much was that you didn't, like right when I got a 3D TV, you could have done the firmware update right then, but yeah. I would have bought a 3D Blu-ray player before it was even a 3D Blu-ray player on the market, you know? All it needed was a firmware update, and that, that but they didn't pissed do that. me off so much that yeah, yeah, like, the, my player players like, never did that. broke literally the day after the warranty expired, and it fucking pissed me off so much. Yeah, I added one more 3D Blu-ray to my collection, and I'll be yeah. talking about my first playback uh, during Paint Thoughts as well for Step Up 3D. But yeah, I got the, the Lego Movie Everything is Awesome edition. I got a steal, too. I got it on eBay for $20, never been used. The 3D Blu-ray was still in cellophane, so I got my, my ultraviolet code. It has a Vitruvius Lego figure in it. That's the cheapest I ever saw it. I almost bought it for $25. I'm happy I saved the $5. I paid for my lunch today. Um it looks really that 3D photo might be the stupidest thing ever in a Blu-ray set, but it looks really cool on the shelf. You mm-hmm. got to give them that. Like it really sells that this is a 3D movie by just looking at the case. Um, anyway, last little piece of news here before we get to Penny Thoughts. Uh, it's also about Sony and it's about their other tech and it's kind of PSVR but not quite. Uh, they released a passenger's VR experience this past Tuesday to tie into their home video release of the film, which by the way is the latest in their line of. It's a combo pack. You get the ultra high def Blu-ray. You can watch in 4K. It has a 3D Blu-ray in the box, also the standard mm-hmm. Blu-ray and digital. So I don't know why everyone else isn't doing this. They've done it now for Angry Birds, uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, mm-hmm. uh, Ghostbusters 2016, and now Passengers. So every film that they've produced in 3D has gotten a single package for 30 bucks with the 4K copy, also. Yeah. Everyone should be doing this that has made a 3D movie. You shouldn't be doing the Warner Brothers route. Do you want the extended version of Batman vs. Superman? Or do you want the 3D version? Not only that, but you only get the extended version on a 4K disc, which you can't necessarily play yet. You you could stream it digitally, but still. Literally, yeah, literally I can't. The best deal for that one was the 3D version, because I could have gotten everything I basically wanted out of that and play it on everything I needed. I know when I get my 4K HDR TV and I get my Blu-ray player that can support the format that I'm going to watch. now, though, I was like, I'm "Eh, most likely going to watch Donna Justice first because that's a real pretty movie. Uh, Speaking of, I got a free copy of Man of Steel this week, which was cool. So now I I need to buy Suicide Squad, (laughs) and I'll probably buy that one in 3D just because the 3D was good. that much? The 3D was good. I mean... The movie's not very good to begin with, but in 3D... I like the movie, though. In 3D, Still. it was a lot of fun. There there weren't, like, great pops or anything. There was a lot of depth. I'm sure um, that the graphics, when they're doing yeah. the intros... and everything, yeah, During that's the intros. probably the one that would be the most playful. Certain other little things, too, but most mostly the intro stuff. Uh, we got an episode for Suicide Squad, also Batman vs. Superman. We got dollar views for both of those, and uh, a few dollars more for Batman. Um... Final little thing, I lied. That wasn't the last thing. Uh, I didn't even finish the talking point. So, yeah, Passengers, they got a VR experience out there. It's about 20 minutes. It costs $10. It's the first project from Sony Pictures VR. They've done other VR things at Sony, in particular in relation to promoting their own projects. And uh, most importantly, uh, Ghostbusters had a full-on, like, multiplayer experience in Times Square last year. I think it was, like, 30 bucks on top. No, it was... Uh, Fifteen dollars on top of your entry fee into the Wax Museum at Adam Tussauds, New York. Um, but this is run by the same guy that was in charge of that project. It's a big thing. Spider Man undoubtedly is going to get something. Probably the Emoji Movie. We're talking about the Dark Tower. Any Sony tent pole for the end of time until VR dies, which it probably won't, is mm-hmm. going to be getting some kind of tie-in like this. Uh, to put it in perspective. $10 is also the asking price for the Martian experience that Fox put out there. It's probably going to be the same price for the Planet of the Apes. It, it seems like if you're not doing a full-on video game, $10 makes sense because this is something that you're only going to do once. You're not going to replay it. Uh, Passengers, for instance, I still haven't seen the movie. I want to see it in 3D. You play someone not Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, and you awaken in one of the pods, and you get to explore the ship. I think it's something like that. So kind of cool. What I'm waiting for, you know, we're talking about 
the 4K Blu-ray coming with the 3D copy, coming with the Blu-ray, you know, that great combo pack. What I want to see is the digital version of that where you get the the HD or even the Ultra HD copy of the film plus the VR experience for, let's say, 30 or $40. Because ultra high def content costs thirty dollars a pop so add that ten dollars on maybe make it 35 or better yet if you pre-order the movie you get the vr experience for free that would entice people to buy a vr headset Mm because currently this experience you can only do on oculus or steam vr so it's not even on psvr yet the martian is you can do that one but that that you know came out about a year after it was released this was day and date on every vr platform except their own which is kind of foolish but also makes sense because i guess sony doesn't know how to put their own things on their own system well then i I don't (laughs) know like did they develop it themselves or was somebody else hired i I don't know is it like one of those weird video game deals from back in the day where it's it's all over the place yeah no i think this i i don't so it just makes no sense then what it probably is is it's a lot easier to code for oculus and for steam vr and they're probably trying to optimize the language for PlayStation VR. I would hope that's what it is. Uh, maybe it comes out, if not this upcoming Tuesday, the Tuesday after that. But it's, they'd be pretty foolish. And like, yeah. I'll check the, the PlayStation Store. I'll see if PSN has some kind of bundle like that. Because this is going to be the first time a VR experience by Sony in particular is going to be on their own store. Uh, whenever that comes. So hopefully there is that bundle. That would be really cool. But I hope... There, there is some kind of thing like that, like a super ticket almost. Um, because they do have promotions, for instance. It'll be like, it's one of those, the movie just came out, it's still in theaters, but you can pre-order it on our store. Everyone does it, Amazon does it, iTunes does it. Um, and sometimes on Sony, if you pre-order the movie, you'll get like the prequel or something. Like I think for John Wick they did that. Pre- like pre-order mm-hmm. John Wick 2, get a copy of John Wick today. Uh, mm-hmm. They did that for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I think you got a copy... Uh, I, don't, I don't remember Harry which Harry Potter, Potter you got, but you got one of the movies, yeah. So they've done something similar to that. Um, yeah. Maybe for this upcoming Spider-Man, you get Civil War, or even better yet, like Spider-Man 1 or 2. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> final piece of news right now, until we, we do our ad break. The first Project Alloy device, which is Intel's own VR headset, except that's kind of uh, a misnomer. They are not making it. It's more like they made the technology and they're leasing it to other people so they don't have to actually spend money. And better yet, the technology that's going to be in the, inset, in, in the headset is going to be an Intel processor. The only reason they even got into the VR game is so they could put their Intel core processors into other devices. Um, it's said that it's going to be having a holiday release the current price range is a thousand dollars, so this is going to be by far the most expensive VR headset on market. To put that in perspective, if you want HTC Vive, you're spending about eight hundred dollars plus a computer. The thing, though, here is Project Alloy does not require sensors or cameras like HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, or PS4 VR require. It's all inside out, so all of the technology is within the headset itself. All of the the room tracking and room scale and everything like that. Uh, So it is a lot less demanding on your home, your budget, and also your computer. Uh, But $1,000 is crazy town. Like, I... This is a year and a half removed from when the world first adopted VR. And to put an even higher price, which, mind (laughs) you, makes sense because higher spec, better tracking, inside out. You know, all these buzzwords make sense in terms of, oh, you got to spend more money to get it. But with Oculus just dropping the price, by then, who knows? PlayStation VR could be even cheaper. I don't know who this is going to sell to, especially because it has a different design language. There isn't a marketplace in place yet. They don't have content partners. It could very possibly be released with no slate of content. And if you spend a thousand dollars, like people are already Without giving anything for people yeah. to consume. Like Nintendo's already getting shit because the Switch has like ten games and counting, and it costs three hundred dollars. This is three times that price, <laughs> and currently there's zero. But when there is something, I'm sure you know it'd be amazing. Uh, yeah, this is the part where we could pitch your product, and to give you an idea, I got a lot of Legos in my room. I love Lego Dimensions. Like, let me sell it to you because that's what I'm trying to do. You ever play with Legos? Better yet, you ever played a Lego video game? 
Imagine you could take your Legos, put them on a portal, and they're in the video game. You like Ghostbusters? You like Back to the Future? How about the Lego movie? It doesn't matter. It all works. You get an action figure. You get a little minifigure. Maybe you get a car. You like Homer Simpson? How about his car? Maybe a TV set that blows up. I got Krusty with a pie. So fucking cool. Super cheap, too. You're talking about like $12. That's less than a movie ticket. You get an action figure in the real world. You also get it in the video game. And you can play it for countless hours. Lots of entertainment there. It's good for the whole family. We're talking about two players. It works on every system. Maybe you got a PS3 right now. You want to get a PS4? Don't have no fear. The Legos are going to work on both systems. It's super easy. <laughs> and it's that easy for me to pitch your own product, too. Actually easier because you can give me a script. I'm not going to be spitballing. You can find out how. Patreon.com slash dollar reviews. We're trying to keep the show running. As I said a little bit earlier, it might not last that much longer. We'll be talking about that in a second. This is episode 88, 100 might be my cutoff. Uh, it's a lot of work. I do it every day, and, and no one pays the bills except me. Um, but, yeah, here's uh, here's Penny Thoughts. This is the original closing segment announced in the middle of the show because, hey, whatever, fuck you. Uh, basically, the way I see it is for you to really care about our two cents on the topics that matter. It makes sense if you gave us a penny for our thoughts first. Uh, and we just run down any movies or music or TV or anything else for that matter that we might have been running through this past week or, in this case, the last five days, six days. Um, what about you, Steve? What, what, what do you do this week? Um, all right. Uh, I guess, well, first thing I saw, uh, I, I guess, is... Correct me if I'm wrong. I swear I saw this on your top ten, but one of your favorite movies of the year was The Edge of Seventeen. Oh yeah, definitely. Amazing. Yeah, um, and I liked it. Um, you know, I, I'm not as enthusiastic about it as you were, but in general, yeah, I thought it was you know a good, uh, fairly funny, fairly amusing high school coming of age comedy. It, honestly, like I didn't see that much about it that was unique for me. But about the animation I from laughed. um from mm-hmm. fuck what was his name? Oh, I was the love interest, the main love interest. Uh, uh, yeah, what, er, Irwin. Irwin, yeah, his yeah, animation no, that, was awesome. Yeah, no, that that stuff was cool, but I mean, you know, for me, it's it's just another high school coming of age story about someone that's basically learning that the world does not revolve around them and that most of their issues are, but you see, really insignificant. You so, said another coming of age story. They don't make those anymore. Like seriously, last year I think there were three. And the only one that matters is Edge of Seventeen. Well, they're, well, they're uncommon now. It's a it's a mostly dead genre, and probably because of TV. I don't know. Maybe I I feel like I've seen quite a few this decade that maybe I'm just this, kind of no, yeah, this decade sure, it, but, yeah, but we're like, more than halfway through it. But in terms of like on an annual basis, we get just about as many westerns nowadays. Yeah, well, three's a healthy helping, I think. But two, um, get, yeah, I mean, not, get, not to talk to down three. on the movie though. But I like, I do like it. You know, the stuff with Woody Harrelson is definitely like he is the scene stealer of the movie. <laughs> um, I think Irwin's a scene stealer. Oh, oh that, yeah, that, in in his own way, I think. Like you know, those interactions they're definitely awkward, but they're also pretty endearing to watch. Because like, Woody Harrelson, you come to expect it. He's I mean, Haley Seinfeld, you know, well, she's then, a name, like, she's, there's she's so in big movies. There's so many jokes from Woody Harrelson and lines mm-hmm. that I already knew because they were in the trailer, and I'd seen that so many goddamn times before the movie even came out. Like, the the thing with the uh, accidental Facebook message that's sent, you know, which gets mm-hmm. big laughs in the theater. Yeah, I knew what that was ahead of time. It doesn't make it less funny, but, you know, like, that's definitely a high... Um, a high trailer moment for a good reason because it's really goddamn funny. It's written, directed, and stars a woman, which doesn't happen frequently, no, especially in the coming of age genre. Uh, matter of fact, uh, besides Clueless, I can't think of another one. Mean Girls, no, directed by a dude. no, no, because that's Mark Waters. Yeah, yeah directed I mean, by a dude. If you want to be technical, Two or three. but I mean, I still. You you know it's I I don't want to judge a movie's merit based on those reasons. But I mean you know it's a quality film though. It's really well made. It's uh, it, it's funny. Um, I I don't know. I just maybe I've seen too many uh, high school coming of age movies, or maybe I'm just not that enticed by it anymore. Like I I feel like I might be getting more distance now by high school movies. You're naturally gonna see another one age. this year. You're gonna mm-hmm. see Spider Man Home- Homecoming. You're gonna and see Power Rangers, I'm, and I'm not even that excited about Spider-Man: Homecoming. It's called bullshit. Honest. I'm I'm really not. No, I really am just kind of bummed that we're not continuing the Andrew Garfield storyline because I was actually a big fan of Amazing Spider-Man Two. I'm the guy we, that hey, we might be. We'll be talking I about that a little bit. You know, the stuff for, with Spider-Man and Civil War. I thought, yeah, you know, he's good, but 
Uh, then again, I don't think he even belonged in that movie. He had no business in being in there because they're just setting him up. So I already feel like they sort of fucked that up to some degree. I, I mean, hopefully, you know, Spider-Man Homecoming, that's his own movie, though. That's his own territory. So hopefully he'll be telling his own story. Yeah, but I hope they're not it's, cramming it's, in Avengers stuff. In no, there. it's it's mostly going to be Iron Man with Spidey. Like, you, yeah, that's seen the trailer, right? Like, yeah, and I'm, I'm yeah. like, yeah. It, it, I hope that's it's, all it's of the Robert Downey Jr. Really in the movie. And they put in yeah. the trailer to sell people before they see the movie. Yeah, but it seems like it's gonna be him showing him how to fight and shit. Which I know, and I doesn't. Just, I, I I get an Iron Man two vibe out of some like that. Really, I do. I I I would love to be wrong, you know, but mm. I'm just not that jazzed about it to be honest. But you know, the movie still has plenty of time to come out, and I'm sure a lot of people are gonna love it, and hopefully it's good. But yeah, no, Edge of Seventeen. It's uh, it, it's good. Like. I'm I'm just curious though, like what is it? Because I I think you have a much more obvious appreciation for it than I do. Like what made this uh, cut the get the spot on your top ten? It was just the writing, man. I, yeah, it was a great script. I, I said it in my little review on Two Cents, probably like ten ten weeks back or whatever. Yeah. Like I there it, there seems something familiar about it, and then when I did the research, I found that the writer director also wrote Post Grad, which is a totally underrated Alexis mm. Bledel Michael Keaton movie from the the early two thousands. Um, just it's I, it's a smart script. It, it's a coming of age movie, sure, and we get a lot of those, whatever. Um, but it's R rated and not just for whatever reason. It's R rated because it tells a story and it uses things of the real world that are important for someone who's on the edge of 17, someone who's about to become a real woman and enter the real world that you have to know that, you know, you kind of hinted about the Facebook message. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can't write something like that. And this yeah, is why I honestly, totally. I, I forget about ratings. Now I take them for granted because, you know, I'm not under 17 anymore. So I totally didn't think of that. Um, that th this actually was kind of a big deal that they made a movie for yeah. basically kids that are 15 or 16 like, think, or 17. Put it this way. Sucks that they couldn't get in though. Dope is R-rated because you see boobs and there's parties and there's drugs and mm -hmm. there's all there's drug sequences and you know parties. I already said that and weapons and you know, there's lots yeah. of shit in dope. You know it's like like you said it's a Scorsese movie for for black youth, um, or or better yet like super bad. You know like that's, that's yeah. the hard R party buddy hangout. That's flick. the high school fantasy movie. This is just a straightforward coming of age movie with a female center that isn't PG-13. They could have easily done that. Like, Highly Se Seinfeld, from just a musical standpoint, has mm -hmm. enough of a built-in audience that it would have sold tickets, and instead they didn't back down. They didn't neuter the script. They let a first-time director make something like this. That stands out. Like, it, it really is its own thing. Like, it might borrow here or there from the genre, but it's it's pretty unique, and it has great commentary, especially about what it's like growing up. Like, she has a couple lines where it's like, sometimes I feel like I'm a really old lady because I don't understand the internet and cell phones, and, you know, I just want to hang out in your office for lunch and, and eat with you. And it's like, as <laughs> someone who would stay after class to talk to professors, especially in college, I just really related to a character like that who thinks she's smarter than everyone in the movie and she realizes at a certain point in the film that she isn't, that she still has a lot to learn. Even though yeah. she's at the end of being a teenager, that means jack shit. Like, it's it's a smart world. Uh, it's just great world making. Uh, I, I really love the production design. It, it's something that I wrote about in Letterboxd, the fact that <laughs> she literally is like wearing a different pair of shoes in every scene. Every outfit is different. Like, it's not something that strikes me, but like I, I can definitely appreciate why you appreciate it. I like, do, I definitely did know people um, like this girl in high school, but I definitely was not one of those people that would hang out in class and talk to teachers. So, uh, you know, it's it's definitely though tr true to uh, the high school reality I'm familiar with to some extent, and there there were definitely, I don't, know, I, I'm not negative on it. I just wasn't like, you no, know, I, I just struck think, by it. I, I, I found it enjoyable though. It was a really good time. It was emotional. Yeah. It was funny. It had a great message that I hope a lot of teen girls um, caught. I hope they watched the movie. They probably did in some way. It's already a home video. I mean, you saw it mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Um, I got it thanks to T-Mobile, Fandango Now. Yeah, I wish that yeah. I, I caught it in theaters because I... I'm sure the Same audience here. would have been awesome. I mean, yeah. I, I was lucky enough that I saw Paper... Did I see Paper Towns in theaters? No. You did. Did you I? Did. Yeah. I did. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah, yeah totally I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have grabbed that poster. <laughs> the AMC was... That's also a good movie. They had a great AMC promotion. You got a poster, and then you also got, like, a locket from the movie. 
yeah. and we ran out. But ah, I would have loved to have that poster. It was like when the the little one shoots. That'd have been cool. That was a good movie. Yeah, Paper Towns is my favorite coming of age movie uh, of twenty fourteen. Probably in the past like three years. Twenty fifteen. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I I preferred yeah. Edge of Seventeen over Paper Towns. Big yeah. time. Big time. Okay. Like Paper Towns, I liked because it's a blending of my two favorite genres. It's the rom com, mer- uh, like who done it? You know, it's it's the mystery meets the rom com meets mm-hmm. the coming of age movie. Like it's done really well. But Edge of also Seventeen, also probably the best Pokemon reference in any yeah, movie ever. Yeah. ever. Um, yeah. But it Edge of Seventeen is just like I hope it's the future of the coming of age film mm-hmm. where it doesn't kind of th- there's no hidden agenda where you know it's trying to sell a certain kind of clothing or like obvious product placement. Like, yeah, every time you see her wearing vans, you know, vans gave them some money for that, whatever, but it's not like over the top. Oh, let, let me go to the mall so I can get my ears pierced at Claire's type of shit. You know, I've never gotten that sense from the ones I know. Like I never, that's never in something like super bad or in, um, Hell and even Juno, you know. I mean, yeah. Like, well, we're we're listing more R-rated coming of age movies, but when you're watching something, um, well, Juno's PG thirteen. Is it? Yeah, that could easily been R-rated. When you no, think knocked about, up was the R-rated pregnant like, movie. When, when you think about the kind of shit that comes out of Ellen Page's mouth in that movie, or just mm-hmm. the the setup itself, like I'm gonna give my oh yeah, not just because quite... it has its own stylized <laughs> dialogue, it's it's well written enough where you know exactly what she's implying, but it's not exactly obscene and vulgar, so it still gets I'm away so, with a PG-13. I'm so happy Juno isn't a thing anymore. I remember when people were like, I love hamburger phones. I still like that movie. Oh, I like orange lot, Tic Tacs. Man. I wanna, like, it just, I'm not talking about the film itself, but more so I know, the yeah, kind the, of cult the, following that certain exactly, films yeah, it definitely garner. Got, which it became overrated real quick. It, it's not even necessarily overrated. I think that's the wrong word for it. Because well, no, wait, that was cool that for that year it was like, oh, a teen movie got nominated for Best Picture. Like, when the fuck does that ever happen? And then all of a sudden people well, just wouldn't also, shut up about also it. Also won two Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 too. Yeah. Um, wait, what was the second one? Because it won Best Original Screenplay. And then actress, I think, or no, 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 no. That was, uh, I think she was nominated then. Um, well, I, originally I was thinking it was J.K. Simmons, but no, because he didn't Jason win until Reitman. Whiplash. Um, n- no, no, it was no. one Oscar. Um, it was one Oscar. It was nominated for yeah, like no, three was, or four, but only won one. I guess, yeah, yeah, because Allison Janney page one, and then I was like, no, oh, wait, no, no, no that no. was uh-huh. um, Marion Cotillard that yeah, year. Yeah, Allison Janney, I think, was nominated. If it wasn't her, it was J.K. Simmons. It was, it was someone in that movie, and then it was it won screenplay. I think Jason Reitman might have been nominated, but that was a strong year. So the director, yeah. He probably wasn't because it was such a strong year. Um, doesn't matter. No, he, he was nominated. Um, was he? Yeah, I think he's he's been nominated twice, I think. And up in the Air in that one, yeah. Yeah. I have Up in the Air. I need to rewatch that. Yeah, it's a good movie. I saw that on Christmas on a date. <laughs> Perfect movie for that. Such a good oh, yeah. movie. Um, but anyway, you know, speaking of high school coming of age movies that are female centered, um, that that focus on the female experience, that are written and directed by female filmmakers, also debuts uh, for that matter, so would also receive the triple F rating. I saw this movie Raw, which is this um, this foreign film from France, which is this really j- just. It really surprised me. Like that's a coming of age story. That's not exactly you know. It's it's not exactly a comedy, but it can be funny at times and uh, just pretty emotional and yeah, just it's the beautiful. Cannibal movie. It is a cannibal movie. That is exactly what I'm getting at. This thing was. I saw trailers for this. Um, I don't even know how many times to count. Like just every single time that I went to see a movie, um, there would be a trailer attached to this, and the trailer is pretty fucking awesome and just striking and it's cut to this beat and you're just watching this really unnerving imagery and you're just like, what the fuck is this going to be? And there's all these, you know, this is a movie that did the festival circuit. So there's all these like one word quotes that are like just taken from reviews that say things like, you know, audacious, intense and all that shit in the way it's cut. Um, And yeah, this movie also had the reputation of people fainting or throwing up at festival screenings. So like it was getting that kind of, um, just that kind of rep, especially when you throw in the word cannibalism in there. And no, I I don't think it's that shocking. I mean, I mean, I again, heard... you know, given the subject matter, I can't say that you know I can't see why someone wouldn't faint. But when you go in with that expectation, I don't think it lived up to that. I heard far more divisive stuff about Flying Lotus's film that was in Sundance this year that I forget the mm-hmm. name of. 
But that one was supposed to be, like, the real one that made people throw up or walk out because it was gross. And even, like, critics are like, yeah, this thing's pretty fucking gross. But, yeah, every everything I've read about Raw on Twitter, and you're not the first person to make the connection um, with uh, Edge of Seventeen. And then even furthermore, mm-hmm. like, Get Out. Like, a string yeah. of films that have come out recently by first-time directors. I saw that tweet today, That yeah. wrote their own project that happened to be, like, really fucking good. And, like, within the genre, too. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's a great time. You know, everyone can't stop sucking Get Out stick about, oh, it, it, it it's reclaimed the micro-budget blockbuster. It's like, no, it, it didn't. It's a pretty awesome movie, but yeah, you know, the, I mean, My, don't give it too much credibility no. by discounting everything else that's been around. You or, know? or better yet, um, maybe it made so much money because Blumhouse knows what the fuck they're doing, and they always make money. Mm-hmm. Gee, didn't Split make a fuck ton of cash? Yeah, wasn't that like four? Is that, that like two weeks right before now? Get Out oh, yeah, came out? Yeah, wasn't that like, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but no, like Raw. I mean, uh, you know, aside from just the very human angle of it, like I, I'm still thinking about this movie. Like even that, I, I kind of want to see it again. But this is a different coming of age movie in that it's it's really where you learn something about yourself that you do not necessarily like, but you cannot help and you have to live with and yet the fact that it manages to take something just so fucking just insane and immoral like cannibalism you know and and finds a way to like in some way just create empathy from that i'm i'm kind of amazed that anyone could tell a story that just triggers that like you know this it, it's it's not just the fact that this is a a french production and you know we also we we talked about l but like uh, some I really loved about that movie is that it gave you just a very complex character that is difficult to like but you can still empathize with and it's really that same deal here where I'm I'm just amazed that any sort of empathy can be generated from w- what's happening on screen here it's it's really an insane movie and if um if you're if you feel you're brave enough to go in, into it, then yeah, I, I definitely Oop. think it could be rewarding. But it? yeah, this totally it's a twenty four really right? surprised me. No, 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 it's um, uh, Focus World. Oh, fuck yeah, fucking Universal. So yeah, I don't know how I'm going to see it then. No, well, HBO Go maybe. That's um, gonna be a long time from now. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Well, hey, you got your Halloween thing coming by that point too. Hey, yeah, that's true. If you get a free Fandango now, Rental, then just use that. No, I'll probably just wait for Halloween. Do Raw, yeah. do Get Out, do Split. Because, like, I yeah. think I'm going to try to stay away from doing, like, classics. Because I've, I've seen most of them at this point now. Well, so and I would just try to catch up. a horror film now, that, like, well, that just I've seen it. Like, the trailer genre. definitely builds it up like that. But, yeah, no, it's... Just catch up on all the stuff that I missed from the last year. Yeah. So I think that's what like, I'm going to do instead in October. This is really an interesting beast, though. Like, I just... You, you know, I, I, this, I don't want to call it too soon, but I think this could be one of my favorites at the end of this year. Um, yeah, just very, very different from any other coming of age movie I've seen. Like it's, I hate overusing this word, but this is really a unique beast and like, just, you know, I'm sure it's been said to death too, but whenever you see a debut that's this good, you know, like even, even with some like what Jordan Peele did with Get Out, that is just that visionary on a very small scale. That's what's weird though. Like like, that's not a true debut because he's been directing the he's been in the industry, but well, like not that's, even that. that's no, the first one that's really him. He's been directing skits, or at least writing them and creating them, on multiple sketch comedy shows for like a decade. Yeah, but a debut feature film that for sure. that movie is that as- atmospheric and like has just some really... But they were in really Keanu, cool which they, directorial they, force they, mostly, thrown in there. they mostly wrote Keanu. Yeah, and then somebody else directed that. Yeah, but I someone mean, that directed thing, mo- like... like a lot of episodes of their show. <laughs> the thing is, you can watch Get Out and just completely forget that it's directed by Jordan Peele. Like, he is not even a presence in that movie. Uh, you could find, like, some of the his sense of humor from Key and Peele if you watch enough of those sketches. But, I mean, you can easily just watch that movie and just completely forget who is directing. And then, you know, just you see just a little flourish in there and you're like, what the, Jordan Peele did this? What yeah, the some, fuck? Like, there's th- this something seems about like, that movie, There's man. like such a like H- Hitchcocky and like Vertigo sort of hallucinatory moment in there that happens where you're just like, who the fuck directed this? This I is rarely, so good. I've never seen anything like that. I rarely feel like I have to see a movie just because of the people around me. 
But Get Out is one of those where it's kind of got to that point now. It's, I yeah, went to my, my brother's house the other night. To a sense yeah. of obligation. I, I right? went to my brother's yeah. house the other night. Like, I sit down on his couch, and his girlfriend asked me, oh, have you seen Get Out yet? And I'm like, oh, I don't really watch horror films in theaters. And she's like, oh, it's not that. It's like a thriller. And, like, she starts talking about it for a little bit. I, I went out to L.A. <laughs> the other night. Same exact thing happened. Like, I'm, I'm standing there, and just someone asked me. Um, you know, he's into movies and shit, too. And he's like, you see Get Out? I was like, no. And he's like, oh, man, you got to see it. Um, and then in, we end up talking about, like, a couple other things, including, like, the Lego Batman movie, which he hasn't seen, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, John Wick 2, which we were split on, because I, I said the exact same thing I said on the show. Where I was like, you know, I generally like movies that aren't setups for sequels. And he was under the impression <laughs> that they knew during the first John Wick that they were going to make a trilogy. I was like, no, 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 no. They no. weren't going to even make a sequel. That's why it took three years. Yeah. Um no, but I mean, well, in the case of Get Out, it's like, you know, I'm glad I saw that opening weekend at where I could just see the movie and enjoy it with a crowd of people and then get out before I fucking started even hearing all those conversations. Not even saying that on purpose, by the way, I just realized that. But, um, and then, yeah, you know, it's, it, it sucks, though, like, when you see something that's good, but you know exactly what the conversation is going to be. Mm-hmm. And that that just sort of diminishes the movie itself. But you know, like once that all blows over, man, like I'll see you. I'll I, see you I really, yeah, I, I, I hope that the movie, like, I, I still think it'll hold up that well, even though it's very much a movie of this time. It's I don't think so. I've seen the Stepford really Wives. Fucking well so, put together. You, I, I've seen the Stepford Wives, unlike most people that have seen this flick, and so I hope that doesn't diminish its, uh, its impact. And I'll find out probably, you know, in like six I, months or so. I don't think it will. I hope not. Honestly. I have not seen Step Her Wives. I've exactly. seen the remake, but um, even still, yeah. Well, we'll see. But um, you know what? Last thing, uh, I saw the Beauty and the Beast remake. Did you fucking really? And I'm using the word remake here, not reimagining, because no, it's, it's not the one. It's not the one that you think it is. Uh, th- this is from the 1946 French film by Jean Cocteau. Like that's the original one that I'm talking about. The remake is this 2014 Beauty and the Beast that stars oh, Vincent Castle you're talking as the about, Beast. You're talking about Beast? No, no, no. It's called Beauty and the Beast. Not, not fucking Beastly. Not whatever the fuck. Oh, yeah, be- I'm thinking of Beastly. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, no. This one, I don't even know if you knew about it, but uh, yeah, Vincent Castle plays the Beast, and uh, what's her face from Blue is the warmest color, and uh, Spectre, and um, not, not to pull the French card on you, but I'm pretty sure his I, I last name is Cassell. I forget her name all the time. Cassell, because he's I, French, it yeah, wouldn't no, be Castle. <laughs> that's the worst thing about it. Is like, do I pronounce it the American way no, or the French he's, way? No, you pronounce someone's name based on what country they're from. You do it in their no. It's, it's just I always just flip flock it back and forth. Like it's like people like don't that. say Audrey Tutu. Aud- Audrey Tattoo, right? Yeah, what? Well, they don't say Tutu. I, no, it's you don't say it yeah. like that. You don't say Cahier du Cinema. Cahier du Cinema. You can't do it. Like if if something originates from somewhere, it's like it's kind of like and it's my least favorite thing. Francois Truffaut. It, it's it's and eh, that one's kind of in between. It, it's when uh someone because no, everyone says Francois. It's whatever, but it, it's it's yeah. it's one of my like big pet peeves when someone, especially if they're from like the background for the word they're using, all of a sudden puts on like an accent. It's like. Oh yeah, we're gonna get some quesadillas, and it's like you—you you never speak like that, but now you're speaking like that because well, it's—it's it's not <laughs> like it intentionally happens. It's you know, dialect just kind of changes based on whatever region you are for whatever point of time. I, like that, that's definitely happened since I've lived in Texas, and I just do it unconsciously. But then it makes me look like a fucking asshole that's trying to fit in, and like I hate that. But that's just that's something that it does. You know, it's. It's it's weird how that works, but um anyway yeah uh, this movie, um which you know the 1946 version that's one that I saw more and more as a kid that's the one that's closer to my heart but um yeah this remake fucking sucks uh just don't watch it like well, it, you I don't know plan it, to. it's don't yeah it's uh, directed to. by the guy that did the 2006 Silent Hill. Um, yeah, which no one saw that either. Not not that good of a movie, but I remember it being pretty cool visually and just having some really cool atmosphere, at least for the yeah, first half of that. the game but... has good atmosphere. It's easy, yeah. easy to steal things like the Pyramid Head and put it on a screen. Like, there's a reason why the Silent Hill franchise has worked for so long, or worked for so long until Konami killed it recently, because they decided yeah. video games suck besides Metal Gear. Um, well, you know, I have to imagine that the Disney remake is better than this one, because, I mean, this one, it... 
it, it starts off pretty promisingly, has a really beautiful theme in its score as it starts, and then the setup is actually pretty good. It, I, I think that just the, the original French version is way more interesting than the Disney one, since... Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of differences. I don't know if you've seen the cocktail one. You have not, have no. you? Yeah, it's worth I've seen, checking I've out. I've seen shots. Of, I've seen clips. Yeah, it's it's very beautiful and just has, like, this really cool gothic feel. And, like, the first third of this, like, almost feels like if Disney hired Tim Burton to do a remake of his version and, and he decided to stick closer to the uh, original French story, like, it could have been that. And that's what it feels like. And then the middle of this is where it really drops the ball because that's where Belle is supposed to be stuck at the castle with the beast and rather than seeing some relationship grow you just get this bullshit thing where every time she's sleeping there's like fireflies like just surrounding her and she's seeing all these flashbacks of how the beast became the beast and so you don't even see that relationship grow you just get this bullshit thing where oh so she just kind of loves him out of empathy and out of spite and then the fucking third act is such a fucking mess where it just tries to be this really weird ass spectacle and becomes a CGI mess with no personality and uh, it's just like I I kind of tried to think like you know okay maybe this was just okay at the end of it but then the more I thought about it the more it just really really irritated me and it's a bummer that this is such a missed opportunity because there was legitimately like some really cool elements that were set up in that first half and then they just don't come together and then there's no relationship at all that grows or any way of like you know whether it's romantically or not you know like there's no chemistry or anything that's formed it's just it's just like shit has to happen for the sake of it and it just it doesn't work so avoid the 2014 version at all costs i'm very sad to say that i'm so happy that fucking era of filmmaking is dead when everyone was trying to make a, a new version of of classical uh, fairy tale films when they you got like this movie and Beastly, but then like Mirror Mirror and and Snow so White and the think Huntsman. It's dead when they're doing a remake of no, see, the Disney one. No, just it's happened? it's dead in the way that it was because every single studio was trying to do it, and now it's just Disney. And like in comparison to studios that never had a version of the film to begin with, just trying to tap into some fad that they saw was coming in, and it did rightfully so, even on TV between like. Uh, not Fables, that's the comic, um, but Once Upon a Time and Grimm, mm -hmm. and then you have like Hansel and Gretel, Ghost, uh, Witch Hunters, and that sequel, and <laughs> yeah, there, there was just, just stuff that there, was in public yeah, domain. Just so right? yeah, it was, it's always public domain because it's Aesop's Fables, yeah. and then it's it, it's this and that, like it's just story tales. You know, anyone can make a story, and like yeah, from like 2010 to like 2014, like everyone was making one for some reason. And, yeah, it was like a year or two later Disney decided, why don't we try it? And we got what they have, you know. <laughs> uh, but at least for them, it's a remake, not an adaptation. So you can only blame them for what they did in the first place. It's not like yeah, they have it's, some it's original like, work out there, you know. Well, see, it's like whenever you try to, like, redo something, that is that is a good idea. Like, hey, do your own spin on it. Try to offer something new. But sometimes that just doesn't work. Like, here it's... It's it's not that the ideas are bad. It's just that it doesn't know how to play with them. Or I mean, this movie's what like a hundred minutes long, so maybe they cut it down or just got rushed or something. And I, I mean, I don't. You know, it cost uh, I think thirty five euros. So you know, the CGI is not all that great to begin with. But there's some beautiful looking stuff here. And I don't know, just if it was better integrated. Like th there's this really weird finale that just kind of. Uh, just has these giant statues that end up killing these guys that are just I I don't fucking Sound, know yeah, it, it like got really it. weird and had nothing to do with anything and don't worry I don't think anyone's gonna watch it don't worry yeah don't it, I won't. I really see that's the thing when I knew about this like because it it came out two years ago but it just came out here in the U S and I I wanted to give it more credit and you know I would have loved to have been that guy that was all anti Disney right now. Um, just because I'm just not so hot on the reimaginings right now, and like everything I'm hearing about this new one, it's like okay, it's it's good for kids and it's good for families, but almost every millennial and Gen Xer is just going, yeah, the the Disney remake is just a piece of shit that's like literally shot for shot, which is weird, and Emma Watson can't sing and blah 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 and like, whatever. So I would have loved to have found the good one, you know. But no, the good one is the is the '93 feature, the 91. one, the '91. Nominated for Best Picture, yeah. 
I, I went and saw that. And also the good it, one is the 1946 version. I, I saw it in theaters when it's got its 3D re-release. It was awesome yeah. in 3D. It was really <laughs> good, man. Um, yeah, no, Disney's not getting my money again. I already saw it once in 3D. They're calling this Beauty and the Beast 3D. That's its actual like theatrical name. That's how everyone's yeah, referring to it. 3D screens for it. At it's just not even native 3D, as far no. as I know. No, it isn't. I mean, which doesn't matter because most of the film is CG, hence, you know, all of the characters in the castle being, you know, animated in the first place. So it, mm -hmm. it probably isn't a mistake in the same way that the castle itself is fake. You know, it's a green screen. So it probably looks good in the same way that Jungle Book looks good because, hey, that wasn't native 3D either. Um, but no, no, but they planned for that. Shit. They totally planned for that one. They though, plan for this like, one too. This all, one... all of these Disney movies are in 3D. They always will be. No, not creatively. Like you can know that your movie's being released in 3D, and you have stereographers on set, but that doesn't mean they're creatively doing. It's anything a Disney tentpole. It. It's 3D. Disney helped no, no, create I, I... 3D, in the modern sense of the word. Like, di there's a reason why, with the exception of Dread in the Lego Movie, every single one of my 3D Blu-ray says Disney 3D on it. They have to, like, throw it in your face. Like, it's like, yeah, I know it's 3D. No, 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 it's not 3D. It's Disney 3D. And they still do that in theaters. It's like, this is our own tech because we did it best. Um, Even though they take it to Stereo D to convert like everybody else. They got a name brand on it and people buy into mm -hmm. it. And I can yeah. tell you, uh, I didn't want to start there initially, um, but I, eh, I, I, I'll lead up to that. Um, you were talking about Edge of Seventeen, like, yeah, that might have been one of my favorite films of the year. I saw mm -hmm. my actual favorite film of the year <laughs> this weekend, though. I caught Keddy. Talk about it. Uh, it's the Istanbul cat documentary that you've definitely not heard of. Um, just Google it, Keddy 2016. It, it is so amazing. Um, I've seen some pretty pedantic reviews on Letterboxd. People are like, this is basically a 90-minute cat video. No, 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 it's a lot more than that. Yes, the nine subjects of the film, and mind you, it's actually kind of funny because, like, the, the American title for people that won't go to a documentary with some kind of foreign name is Nine Lives, Story of, like, Nine Cats or something <laughs> like that. So I was like, hey, I saw two There's Nine Lives. There's like, five different yeah. movies with Yeah, that I title. saw two Nine Lives this year, and I could have saw the other Nine Lives with Kevin Spacey. So I was like, now I kind of feel like I have to see it. And I, I was, like, almost offended because the person I saw the movie with was calling it Nine Lives. I'm like, no, it's, it's Keddy. Um, <laughs> I was pretty upset. I, I missed uh, maybe the first five minutes because that's a whole different story. We were, like, grabbing a little snack before the showing, and the service wasn't great, and then we, we were a little bit late. Um, but, yeah, no, this is 100% in Turkish. It's, uh, it's not about the people. It's not about the town. I mean, in a certain way it is, but it's about the cats. It's about the nine subjects here. Uh, and from what I read, I think they initially shot, like, 20 or more. Um, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's, it's about a whole different world. It's this port city on the other side of the planet that has a long history and most of it involves cats. And it kind of gives you that kind of background, but that's not what's important. All they have to know is in Istanbul, cats run wild on the streets. And I'm not talking like, oh, they have rabies and they're all over the place. More like they're untamed. Like, you know, when you see like an alley yeah. cat or you're walking home at night, you're like, hey, look, it's a cat. And it's like fairly mm -hmm. uncommon, but you're not too shocked. No, this is a whole different thing. It's like... You don't live in the city and there's cats there. It's like you live side by side with them. And this is something that I've actually experienced when I went to Israel a couple summers ago. It's the exact same story. It's also, you know, not all of Israel, but it's such a small country. We'll just go with it. It's also an international port city with a long history. And I can actually tell you why cats are in Israel, but that doesn't matter. This this is a film about Istanbul, but it's pretty similar reasons. Uh, just like people coming off of ships had cats, and there's a rodent problem by the docks, and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. There's, cats have always been part of the culture, and they've stayed part of the culture throughout history. And it's not really about anyone. It, it's, it's about these cats, <laughs> these, these, these multiple cats. Um, some of them have families. Some of them, there's this crazy one that has, like, uh, a, a husband basically that she's psycho about and mm -hmm. doesn't let anyone get close to. Um, there's this one cat who just had a litter of kittens and she's learning what it's like to be a mom. Um, there's this like aristocratic cat who doesn't beg for food and said like paws on a window for the people in the cafe to feed it. Uh, there's this other one and it's instead of getting, which is like kind of traditional in a documentary where, you know, it's a human subject and they're talking about themselves and then maybe mm -hmm. other people are like, oh yeah, and this person did this and that's how I knew I liked them. No, no, no. 
you could like almost pinpoint the question for the most part that the documentarian, who mind you is a female director, is also a debut uh, debut film, asked these quote unquote subjects. You know, the people that could actually articulate the stories for these these animals that can't talk outside of saying meow or mew or variants on that. Um, and it's usually the same question. It's like, how did you meet the cat? What role does the cat play in your life? What do you do for it? What does it, what do you feed it? What, um, all these things that you normally probably wouldn't care about, but the way that it's just woven into this tableau for this place that you probably have never been to. Uh, you hear music from the region that you've probably never heard. Um, everything from being in a shook, which I would assume is the same word for it, um, or like kind of like a flea market, but like it's instead of having a grocery store, that's what they have because it's more of a communal uh, society. It's more, you know, it's Middle Eastern. Uh, mm -hmm. Just really fascinating look into a part of life. And there's some other great sections too, where it's kind of talking about urban sprawl and how these cats might not be here much longer. Um, and it, it pulls at your heartstrings. There's emotional moments with these cats and their owners and you get into the psyche and uh, it's, it's a big picture, but what it's mostly about is just the, the joy that cats bring people worldwide in particular, this city and and what it means to the varied people that are lucky enough to have these nine cats in their life um but you you get all kinds of uh great shots uh you get like cat fights you get petting you get purring you get like i said you get uh, like nursing kittens um you get a lot of different stuff there's some like great like night vision footage of a cat chasing a mouse like it, it's shot beautifully like i i would assume it's 4k I'm going to buy the Blu-ray. It's out by Oscilloscope, <laughs> so this probably isn't going to be on streaming, but I hope it is, especially on Netflix or Amazon. Um, it's something that I think everyone it has to see. It will be at some point, like, I think. If, if you're a cat lover, if you have a cat, um, if you're interested in kind of like um, travel logs, it's it's pretty much a documentary that doesn't exist anymore. Like It's not about this this crisis about miners and a, and a fucking trapped underground or like this serial killer that got out. or No, 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 no. This is just literally a slice of life. Like What it's like to love cats in the city of Istanbul. Like What it's like to be a cat there. How much they reign free. Like They are the main attraction here. Um, it's just one of those movies when you're watching it and when you leave the theater, you just feel like the joy of life. Like if you see the documentary, there's a good couple of sound bites, and one of them is like, like uh, what more is there? Or no, 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 it's something like uh, when it when you look down at a cat and it smiles up at you, it's like God smiling or something like that. And uh, there's this this one uh, narrator in particular who's uh, who um, is a, a boat captain who's awesome, like. Every, everyone here you can just feel their love for cats it it's it's really its own thing i mean last year we did episodes on keanu and and uh and um cat people, cat people. which yeah. are like no like keanu was totally like <laughs> oh you like cats you like cat videos check this movie out and there's no fucking cat yeah, no, in cat it. people's the opposite of yeah. that where it's more yeah, horror yeah. And of like no there's something this wrong is here. the only movie i've ever seen that truly understands the love i have for felines like to a T. Like, I... Though, when I encounter a cat, especially a cat that I've never met, whether that be on the streets or in someone's house, the immediate reaction I get to, oh, look, it's a cat. Let me see if I can get it over here. I would love to pet it. Well, I'm petting it. It loves me. It's it, like that kind of emotional roller coaster I have with a first encounter is similar to the kind of experience I had with this film. Like, Every time you meet one of these cats, just the the lovingly the loving way that it's shot, and just uh, everyone involved, you could just tell um, it, it's a really beautiful film. I, I hope a lot of people see it. Sadly, they won't because that's the nature of both documentaries, foreign films, and especially you know niche films about cats. Um, like you know, unless it's like a, a big narrative film directed or produced by Steven Spielberg or something like mm -hmm. that that features a dog. You know, dog movies have always been a thing, but cat movies kind of haven't. Like, even in the rare exception outside of the Garfield films where cats are on screen, they've been villains, like in Cats and Dogs. Oh, yeah, Cats and Dogs, like, yeah, absolutely. They, they don't get their due, which is a shame because people forget this. Uh, for a long time, they were worshipped as deities, and they also stopped the Black Plague uh, from spreading, and, and multiple things. They've literally been heroes throughout time, 
and I, I think the the film, you know, I, I undoubtedly have a bias because I'm a cat owner, and I've always yeah, loved cats. I'll be honest, like when I saw that this was on your top ten, I was there. There was this movie in 2010, I think it was this documentary called Babies, where it was just looking at four different babies different. for a year of their lives, and yeah, it and that was all it was. Like it was literally like no, baby videos on YouTube. And I was just like, "Oh God, don't don't tell me it's no, that. I don't, I don't want to have to play devil's advocate." There's yeah, a I mean, slice this... of life here. It's just, it's, yeah. it's no, about it's like cats. It's, yeah, it's, it sounds like it. it. It's it's really beautiful. Like uh, it, it it like most documentaries you watch them, and you're like, "Oh, I could watch this on TV or something." But this truly deserves the theatrical experience. I plan to go again. It's I'm happy to report it's playing at the Art Theater in Long Beach. So that's how I saw it. I told a friend about it. She didn't respond to me in time, so I went without her. I want to see it again. I'll probably take her with me. Like, it it really, it just, um, you know, when the, movies can do lots of things, but one of my favorite things mm-hmm. about films is if you encounter a good one that's just really fun or whatever, you escape into it. Like, you truly escape. Like, you're no longer a person with problems who has pills due in debt sitting in a theater trying to watch something. It it takes you there like you you're <laughs> out like it's not out of body of experience but pretty much like it, it was vacation for mm-hmm. an 80 minutes or so i i was transported i i got to you know it's called doggy cam but it's kitty cam in this film like being able to prowl uh prowl the streets of istanbul at ankle level with a steady cam like just awesome like the <laughs> I, I i can't say enough like it was it transported me back to Israel, even though it's not quite the same country. Uh, but just the the makeup and how cats work in the city, um, and it 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 really is like if they have a cat cafe in L.A., I want to go. It's just it's pricey. <laughs> like that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a cafe where they have cats, and yeah. you can you have to get an appointment and you have to pay in advance. But literally, they just have cats running around the cafe, and you can sit with them. Like yeah, like I want to go. This yes. I want to go do that. <laughs> They have one in L.A., they got one in Washington, and then it's a big thing internationally, especially in Japan. Um, but, yeah, Keddy, please watch it. I'll buy that for a dollar. Like I said, I'm going to buy it on <laughs> Blu-ray. I would love a poster. Um, really good. Like, probably, definitely my favorite documentary I've ever seen. Um, but I... It's really high praise. It's good. It's it's really good. Like, it, it, it's very solid filmmaking. I'm I'm very interested what the director does next, because... You know, it is on my radar, man. See it. Please see it. See it on a big screen. See it on a huge screen if you can. Right. Um, something else I checked out this week that's not a movie, but I'll jump to a movie in a second. Uh, Drake's new, not quite album, he's calling it a playlist, came out <laughs> yesterday, which is pretty awesome. Um, he's trying to trend a new term there. No, no not quite. I mean, it, it isn't a mixtape. Like it, You can't get for free, but you can stream it for free. You can't download it. Like, and that's what separates a mixtape from an album. It's generally it's not beats that are made for the the album itself. They're just like repurposed. It's a mixtape, mm-hmm. um, and there's not really any structure. They're just songs. Uh, and Drake's made mixtapes. He's made like three of them, and you can just download them. Like so far, Gone is one of the most downloaded mixtapes of all time. Um, but this is a playlist, and it, it feels that way. It's called More Life, which kind of is fitting because Views is his most recent album. There's lots of different views of, like, his life and, like, views from the six is, like, his, like, one of his sayings. Or, like, I guess it's, like, just a big Toronto thing. Is it, that's the six or six province or I don't fucking know. <laughs> um, and there's, like, the, the views is of it's, like, a double album. is really long and it's hard to get into and it's all over the place. And there's some songs that really took off. In, in particular, like, Controla and One Dance. Like, these more Caribbean... Um, just like danceable songs that are like party songs. Like if you were to go to a club, especially a mainstream club, you're going to hear one of these songs. You're probably going to dance to it and you're going to have a good time. <laughs> and most of the vibe on this album or playlist as they're calling it is pretty similar. Like this is more life. Like literally um, there's some songs, Blem, um, Teenage Fever. Uh, I could pull it up. But those are the two that really jumped off for me. Um, really good though. I've only listened to it twice. I'm going to wait for an actual download so I can listen to it other than Spotify, but somehow I found a way on my computer to listen to Spotify without commercials without having premium. So it would be cool if I can keep doing that somehow. Um, I think the secret is opening the web player, not the app or the, the program. 
and for some reason it didn't play back to back. I had to pick each track individually, so that might have messed up its play track. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't really know. Uh, I gotta listen to it more. Um, but it, yeah, it's not as long winded as some of his other stuff. It's not quite as emotional. It's, it, it's, it's mostly upbeat. And the reason it's really called a playlist is because there are songs that he's not on like at all. Like Kanye has a song called Glow. Uh, Party Next Door has a track. Um, there's a couple other ones too. Uh, Nothing by the Weekend or any of his other collaborators. Um, but it's it, it's a good time. It was is fitting too because uh, yesterday was that bitch's birthday and I didn't talk to her. And I was like, thank you, Drake. You gave me something to obsess over instead. You're awesome. I love you. I love you, Drake. Do it, Drizzy. Um, so yeah, finally that movie that I teased uh, about an hour ago. I, I did my first. 3D experience at home. Um, glad to say I did it for Step Up 3D. I, I if you haven't been listening to the show in the past weeks, or if you're even listening now, um, if you have a PSVR headset, and if you have one of those, you definitely have a PS4. You can now do 3D playback. I am not sure 3D playback works on 3D TVs, but it definitely works within the headset. It's as natural as taking the 3D Blu-ray disc. You put it. You slide it in the system, and you get a pop-up that says, do you want to watch this in, in PSVR headset? And you go, yeah. And then <laughs> it, it does it all from the, the trailers to the, the, the menu interface to the movie itself. Um, in the way that... Yeah, that's one of the ones that really pimps out Disney 3D Blu-ray. Because oh, that was one of yeah. the first wave of it, it is. They don't do that so much anymore. I think but... it literally is the first uh, Disney 3D Blu-ray. It came out in like, 2010. Did they have spots where it was just like and they had spots for Toy Story 3 and yeah. Tron yeah. on there. Yeah. So they were really pushing that Christmas oh, yeah. Carol. Yeah, Christmas yeah. Carol, yeah. No, I, so they definitely like, I literally that. think this is in the t- the first 3 3D Blu-ray releases by Disney. Um and I also have Tron. Um which I'll maybe watch this week. I kind of want to watch the original and then watch Tron Legacy just because I didn't have the opportunity to do back to back and it'll be funny cuz as you know, I have my Tron copy on my PSP, and I'll probably watch it like that. So I'll do back to back. Go the low tech route, the arcade. I'll, level I'll do version. No, it's yeah. it's not. It's it's HD. It's just it's not so 720. The cutting edge, but really? I'll, it's... I'll I'll do screenings on on back to back PlayStation devices for Tron. <laughs> um, weird PlayStation devices on native you know screen. Um, but yeah, it, it works exactly the same way. As the using PSVR for any other media, you have a choice right from at any moment to change the screen size. The choices are small, medium, and large. When it's set to small, it's kind of like you're what you're like in the back row at a movie theater, and the screen moves when your head moves. Okay, it's great for yeah. like watching TV. There's medium where you're like you're like four rows back. Okay. And then there's large where your front row, which is ridiculous. Both in medium and large, when you turn your head, the screen is stays stationary. And so if they ever build in the functionality where you're actually sitting in a digital theater, those are going to be the modes where you can see the people around you. Uh, when I was playing around with it, also stuff that I found out, um, it keeps the 360 audio intact when you're in theater mode. So if you turn your head to the to the right, you're going to hear the audio from the uh, your left ear, which is kind of bizarre given that, that you're supposed to be in a like theater. That sounds like that could be too annoying. No, it works. I mean, you're. Yeah. Mo- I I was actually like if you drastically turn your head, then you'll hear the. You're phase, you're right? not going to. I mean, think about it. When you're watching a movie, you generally well. That's the thing too. This is kind of the beauty of it. Um, even when you're watching a movie at home. You are likely to turn and check the time or check your phone or maybe get up to do something. When you have this head mount display on your fucking head and you know how much of an effort it is to take it off and, and put it on, checking your phone is no longer even an option. You don't want to do it. Uh, it's well, that's, even that's more the thing though is like when it's the hearing is coming from you know two speakers that are like in your ears, the directionality there, it's different from just having something you know, from the distance that no, can reverberate throughout the entire room. No, that's it's, it, that's the thing. That'd be weird. No, it's it's really good. They have their the own. Work. They have their pad into 360 audio. I don't okay. think that it utilizes the 7.1 sound staging, which is going to be something that I'm going to try out probably with Tron. I might not use the headset that's attached to the the headset. Uh, I might use my stereo, my surround sound headphones, and see if that works within VR. Um, I'll have to see. I'll, I'll report back on that. Yeah, they got a 2.0 track for that. Yeah, it's they? 2.0, so, but, I mean, yeah. if I have a surround sound option, I would prefer that over using the 2.0 that I did for Step Up. Um, 
But anyway, so um, yeah, no, checking your phone is like not even an option. It literally was the most engrossing film experience I've ever had. Because when you're in a theater, you know, you can see the lights around you. You can be looking at the mm -hmm. ceiling or the speakers, especially in 3D. You find yourself taking the glasses on or off. Maybe you got people talking around you, someone sitting behind you, kicking your seat, someone in front of you that their head isn't completely missing. No, you're in a completely black room. There's nothing else, just a screen. And that's it. It is isolating, sure. All VR is. But you fully focus on the film. Every detail matters. Like, you can't take your eyes off of it. And so I, I played around in between small, medium, and large. Uh, mind you, I've seen this film before, so I wasn't really paying attention to the story because, hey, the story fucking sucks. It's a step-up movie. It's, it's a stay of the rec center movie. It's, it's, yeah. That's not why you watch no. it anyway. Man. Yeah, you like, see it. You watch it for the there's dancing. There's some things that are conventional the the, that you the just... Yeah. Um, the, the first step up is is a more... The, the first step up has an actual good story and it's an actually good movie and the dancing is secondary to the romance there. It's the only time that's true for the franchise. Um, but I knew what I was getting into. It's a John Chu movie. I, I mean, I personally like G.I. Joe Retaliation and Gem and the Holy Rams. I mean, and no one's got anything against them. I, I really like Step Up 3D and, you know, I, I can truly say that I really like it now. Uh, matter of fact, I like instagram that i was going to be watching it and i tagged him as kind of like a joke and he he commented like yeah good job um <laughs> so i guess he he's he knows that people he's happy that people still watch the, his movie the way he intended to be watched um but the 3d was awesome especially i i found that watching it in medium work first off sitting front row in a theater for 3d is mm -hmm. a horrible idea don't fucking yeah. do that uh sitting in small like back row the 3d effect wasn't that noticeable but medium, both the pop effects, which, yeah, there's a lot of them in Step Up 3D. Like, they were really playing with the technology at the time. You get lots of stuff coming out the screen. Pollen, water, you get lasers, you get Slurpees. Um, <laughs> That's right. Tidal sequences. Oh, man. You get um, lots and lots of shit, to be honest. Like More it, so than I've ever seen in a movie, which is awesome because that's my favorite thing. fucking reminded thing. me of the lasers, which the is lasers fucking are, insane. They're fucking man. cool, like, man. Yeah. Um, no, like, I, even that trailer for that movie, like I just remember that being something at the time. But uh, that was also like one of those 3D movies where it was so early that they were pushing the graphic yeah, they, of it. Like they, pushing they the push 3D it really hard. The bold text, yeah, like... I, 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 you're a bigger fan of the uh, more gimmicky stuff than I am because you I don't like the pop see it, I don't see it as a more, gimmick, but... to be honest. The way I see it, especially in certain films, it makes sense. That's why it's not in For every this, movie. Yeah, no, no. This, this is about that. Yeah. This is about that kind of fun. It's playing with that space, uh, but it's not... Like Mad Max? Like... You need to experience a flaming guitar shooting a flame at you. You need to experience... And I'm not going to spoil the thing that happens at the end. It doesn't directly go at you for that. A little, it comes well, out me, of the screen, but that, you know, the final real moment that I don't want to talk about in case people somehow still haven't seen Mad Max, <laughs> where it's, no, 3D. And uh, that one yeah, makes that's it a must-watch. the one watch. gimmicky moment, which yeah. I, I... Sorry, I, I can't help but call it that. For me, like, it's I perfect. love... I, I love looking at, like, you know, it, it, it's like a sculpted image, and I like looking at the vast deserts of it. But, I mean, you know, for something like Step Up, no, like, that totally fits with the tone and just the general um, attitude that that movie has. Yeah, you play it's around like, with that stuff. You, you you can go ahead and, like, flaunt stuff at the screen and just have fun with it, and it's not going to kill your eyes for 90 minutes or anything. If it was doing that for two and a half hours, that'd be another story. Like, but The real thing, too, is when it comes to dancing... Three dimensionality is important, especially yeah. with the way windows and staging work uh, with choreography. And so, when you have the dance battles here, the three D isn't a gimmick. It's very rarely even used in terms of pop. It's just depth. Like you can clearly tell who's in the foreground, who's in the back. And instead of having to focus on one or the other, you can watch both at the same time. And well, they it do just, play with it a little bit visually. A little bit, like, yeah. There, like, there is there is one dance where you know a head looks like it's popping out, out of the of screen, the, yeah, out of the Z space yeah. more so, and that, that's directly just giving you something to look at that you can really only see on a screen in 3D because it's just not going to give you that same in your face effect. Like that's completely stylized. It was that's the thing though. Like it's a, it's a nice meshing of the. I two. I wasn't sure because mind you, like the the cool thing that I enjoy about pop effects in 3D is that you're sitting in an audience with a lot of people, 
and you get that moment where everyone kind of reacts the same way because it appears like it's only for you for everyone in the mm-hmm. screening. And because I was isolated, I was by myself, you didn't have that distance from where the screen is to where the chairs are to where you are. Um, you lose some of that, but it still worked. Like, the lasers, they still worked. The pollen that I'm talking about is very nuanced, but, like, the baby powder in the first battle sequence was <laughs> awesome. Like, the most of the of the pop was really good. Like, the landmark 3D experience I've had to date. Because I remember Avatar had... Like, a couple. Like, the first time you encounter one of the flowers, I remember in particular, like... That's the only They shot, touched really, it, and like, it came out of the screen, and it went around the theater, and it was like, oh, man, that, that was cool. That movie's mostly about looking outward, but, I mean, even then, you know, it, I, I, that movie mainly gets credit for the tech. I don't think it's big as far as pushing no. the cinematic language of 3D. The, How to Train Your Dragon fucking top I'll, that two months later. I'll watch that eventually. Uh, and that that's not even fair, though, because, yeah, most of Avatar is 3D animation, but when something is a 100% 3D, that conversion is literally built into the coding. Um, so not not quite, but um, I mean, yeah, the the film is is cheesy. There's lots of gimmicks, but it was worth the ten dollars I paid for it just for the Fred Astaire sequence that I know I'd always loved. Um, it really paid off in 3D, not in terms of pop because there is none, not in terms of depth because that's not there either, but just the fact that they shot that with a 3D rig at the beginning of the current wave of 3D. And it's a single take. Like, that's impressive. Like, the rig is two to three times heavier than a standard camera. That's a lot for an operator. They had a stereographer on set that, you know, was pretty new to the business, I would assume. And yet, it works so well. Like, in 2D, you know, it's it's good. But in 3D, it's really impressive. The fact that they got that done. Um, you can read, like, a, a more uh, straightforward review of this on Letterboxd. Uh, that's L E T T. E R B O X D dot com, um, and my name is is Brian Gillis once again. Um, but yeah, I I hope that I've I've heard mixed things online about Tron Legacy's 3D within the headset. Uh, but then again, if memory serves, just the headset or in general, in general too. But if memory serves, like yeah. it wasn't the most impressive 3D experience, like, with the exception of you know the Wizard of Oz framing, which I'm a fan of, well, that's the and thing, also like, like be able to just the tell colors. What is you'll be able to tell what is shot for it and what's converted or just completely absent just based on the aspect ratio alone. Like it's, well, I could tell for, and they give you that warning of like, Hey, there's portions of this movie that are not shot in 3d. And it's, it's weird. It's like when you see something in IMAX and they, you know, they say like, Hey, uh, some of it's in 2d and some of it's not, but you'll get this warning to take off your glasses. It's like that, except no warning. So, you got to keep well, them on the whole well, time. No I'm going to have to keep so the it's... headset on anyway, so that's not an issue. But what's yeah, stupid but is I've seen on Reddit in particular, you know, there's people that are out there that have bought in like literally like 60 or 73 Blu-rays for some reason because they're crazy. I'm, I'm good with them. my six I have. Um, five? I got like 20, five. I think. But I'm talking about these they're are... They're all for movies I would want to. You no, know, these are people that just bought them because, hey, I got a lot of money. It's 3 yeah. yeah, why not? Uh, and yeah, all of them have reviewed fuck Tron Legacy, people. and they're like, I don't get it. It starts off, it's not even in 3D. And I just, like, smack myself in the head. I'm like, dude, like, you, you missed it. You missed the artistry behind that. Um, it doesn't matter, though. Well, it is irritating, though, to, like, see that when you're watching the movie and you're trying... It's Wizard you of want to Oz. experience something technically to the full, but... No, it... I, Honestly, like, Oz, Raimi's version has a better uh, ratio switch than that, I think. Um, but, it, hey, now for Tron, it's it's still cool for the most part. It's just, it's kind of irritating the way that they decided to present that. I, I think I might actually, will, cause that I think confusion. I'll wait on Tron. I've, like, lapsed in playing LEGO Dimensions, and I'll probably uh, watch the LEGO movie, because I haven't seen that in 3D, and I have seen Tron, and I'm not quite interested in Nomeo and Juliet, and Dread, like, eh. I mean, that's not the greatest movie. I just want it because it was five bucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, I, I wanted to demo the 3D for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I'll probably watch the Lego movie this week and report back on that. And I'm expecting big, big things uh, just because the 3D for the Lego Bat mo- movie was really good. Uh, so I have I have a feeling, like, it's going to be equally good on this one. Um, yeah, you'll get Lego, Lego uh, popping out at me. shot mm-hmm. at you. Yeah. Uh, the final thing I checked out this week, and I wouldn't say this week, I've actually owned it for three years and pe- well full backstory the thing is sly cooper one also known as sly cooper and the thievius raccoonus uh, i bought it on ps2 like 
six years ago or something in a bargain bin. Uh, maybe even a little bit more than eh, it was like six, seven years ago. Uh, I bought it on PS3 like three years back. Uh, I played it for like a day and I stopped. And then over the last week and a half, that's the thing that I've been playing primarily. And mostly because I, I've never played this series, even though I own all the games. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And then also I'm a, a trophy whore and the achievements are very easy for it. Um, I, you know, I had my fair share of ups and downs. Uh, the game is lots of fun. The story is good. I love the cutscenes and the voice acting, but it's it's kind of all over the place. But in a like quirky kind of uh, snapshot of PS2 platforming, and this is like in Sony's heyday when they had a thousand different IPs that people love. They had Jack and Daxter. They had Ratchet and Clank. They they had Sly mm-hmm. Cooper. Uh, now it's you know like oh they got Uncharted and The Last of Us. Like it's a much more serious uh, gaming. Um, and they have like their own like Pixar type sidekick hero getups, and and this is one of the bigger ones just because of its art style, the way the cell shading works. It's really pretty. I the the problem is I don't like stealth games, and this is a mixture between stealth and platforming. But then it has stuff like grinding, like foot rails from Sonic, and 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 other things of that nature. And you get like abilities, and it's also like its own way, kind of like a superhero story. Um, but it's fun. It, it, the The story's fun. Uh, the only problems I had truly, and once again, this is because it's a remaster of a PS2 game. I like with the camera and some of the dynamics and and some of the the control scheme. Like I had some issues here or there, but I played it in two sittings across a week and a half, and you know I got that platinum trophy, and it, it was a good time. And I got three more to do now. I'll, I'll probably do them uh, across the next couple of months or so. Um, but yeah, good time. I like I said at the beginning of the show. It, I dusted off my PS3 to play it, um, which doesn't happen often anymore, and it, it it made me feel good. I was like, I invested, you know... Now you got a story and keep it safe at this point. I invested a lot of time and money into my PS3 collection, and uh, I, I still actually buy things um, for it, and, and this one was, you know, it was good. Um, yeah, that's Penny Thoughts. It probably... I don't know, actually. Um, is this like... Oh, Step Up 3D, by the way, buy that for a dollar. Um... <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, that that's our how we talk about things when we're just doing reviews for things, not the news. Uh, and if you like that, we we do it fairly frequently. We do it at least once a week on Death to Cinema, but that has spoilers. Um, and that comes out every Wednesday. We've done a lot of stuff for that, um, including uh, The Fly, which is going to be a remake of, you know, the Cronenberg remake. That's going to be this coming Wednesday. No, next Wednesday, mind you. Looking forward um, to it. Father the Bride is the one that came out this Wednesday. Uh, that's original. Comes out this Wednesday. A guy named Joe is also an original that became a remake, so we're kind of like on a little remake uh, slot down memory lane. Uh, we also did like Wings, All the President's Men, My Bloody Valentine, Time Crimes. Lots and lots and lots of movies. Uh, we're almost at 90. No, no. Almost at 80 episodes for that show. We're almost at 90 for this one. Um, the other show that we do, though, is Dollar Views, as I said, and we almost never do that. And I, I got a pitch for you, Steve. So, in Debt to Cinema, our mm-hmm. intro is... You know, as as much as we love going to the movies, we can't always do it because, you know, we don't have money. Um, you have Amazon Prime. I have Amazon Prime. You have access to Netflix. I have access to Netflix. I could give you my HBO password. We basically have all the streaming platforms, especially because Hulu doesn't have shit anymore, with the exception of Filmstruck. We have an easy way to do one new, quote-unquote, new release every week. Okay. And I'm going to throw at you why don't we do that i you know two cents is kind of coming to its death uh maybe won't die all the way instead of doing penny thoughts which slows everything down and makes the show about twice as long as it could be (laughs) this could be a one hour news show um how about going forward maybe not next weekend but yeah next weekend starting with camera person if we just stop doing penny thoughts we go back to doing dollar reviews we do debt to cinema dollar reviews every week Instead of watching one new movie a week, we watch two. Because there, uh, that could work. there are a lot of things that both of us haven't seen, and especially one or both of us haven't seen, uh, including Blue Jay, The Handmaiden, Mr. Right, um, anything that Adam Sandler puts out on Netflix, which we've already done before. But there's seriously just like uh, the fundamentals of caring, which I want to see on Netflix. There's a lot out there that we kind of skip over, um, and I would like to watch more movies again. Um, so you want to start doing that next week? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got a, a 
how would you uh, plan for, I mean, starting with camera person, yes, absolutely, but then... We could do the same uh, thing we do on Death of Cinema. We can... Just the same format? Yeah, we do one... Try to keep it light on spoilers, but then yeah, keep it more yeah. steered towards the end? Yeah, like, no... Try to be no spoilers still. Um, mm-hmm. And we could even do the back and forth pick. We could make it easier or hard. What we could do is... Every week, one of us gets sets to cinema and the other one gets all our views, and then we go back and forth that way. Or we could just do unanimous for dollar views. Um, I w- How do you make options. dollar views selections, though, if it's not theaters? Like, just look for something recent that came on the streaming platform? It doesn't or... even have to be recent. Like, that's the thing. Like, there's so much on streaming that not necessarily deserves reviews, but you can review anything. And if it's on streaming, I mean, that's kind of like the get up for for death cinema anyway what if it's something mm-hmm. that's only ever been on streaming and we've done that a couple of times i mean i know you saw shy rack in theaters but and we didn't exactly have an episode for it but we did shy rack no. we did beast of no nations um i'm sure there's going to be another one soon bright is a guarantee um mm-hmm. uh camera person you know like there's there's yeah. enough now like streaming's become such a thing that we could even like just create a new show like dollar reviews could be just theatrical releases and we can make a streaming only show and there would be a, more than enough content available that we wouldn't run out for any time to be honest or just make that part of the intro could be theatrical could be on the streaming platform yeah, we do that or something too. like that we do something like that yeah because i yeah, yeah I, it's not that i necessarily want to stop doing two cents um but i do uh but it's it's also more so penny thoughts you know it was spun off into dollar reviews and then we brought it back because we stopped doing dollar reviews we're ever changing and, right? yeah and we never took the time to really think about the fact that we just like most of hollywood is still focused on the theatrical model and we're not taking we're taking for granted that streaming has tons of options nowadays no uh, indeed i mean you know even forward thinking though at some point just because i'm i'm trying to think two steps ahead but it's like how at some point if we keep doing this long enough we're gonna have to figure out how to integrate vr content reviews i'm sure well, i mean technically i already have not uh, technically you already have, have yeah but i i gotta figure out a way to be part of that conversation <laughs> just financially or uh, hell even if it's not me if you if we fucking recruit somebody else you know like uh just to at least for the sake of getting content out there you know that's I mean, something to think about matter of fact i shouldn't have even reviewed sly cooper because who the fuck cares that game came out like 15 years ago um you wanted to talk about i it. did a new vr thing this week i did uh rigs which was one of the psvr launch titles it's the game that sony pulled the plug on already they shut down the developer that made it it was their big hey we're gonna get into esports by making some game that's only on vr and it's gonna be a hit and it wasn't um and it wasn't necessarily not a hit because of the backing it had a great marketing push i was i mean i automatically interested i never played it and i'm, mm-hmm. I'm like technically renting it right now i'm, I'm not going to keep it because fuck no um i played it initially i haven't played it again before it got its big christmas patch and it made me sick in a way that vr hasn't made me sick in a long time like i was sick for um when i did it a little bit after and a little bit the next day too um I mean, I'm happy to report that they put a big patch out where they fix a lot of things. And I like, I did some Twitch streaming for it where it's mostly me already halfway through my experience. I'm getting mad. Like this game's so backwards. It starts with a tutorial that lasts like close to an hour. So I can just imagine people that just got this game for Christmas or whatever their birthday that have spent, you know, all the coin on it. Like I did just because, yeah. and they want to, you know, do a real game. And instead they have to have their hand held for about an hour and it has all of the bad settings set to it, and you can't change them, including blinders, uh, which is this horrible thing where they obscure your field of view even more on the headset with the worst field of view on the market. And it it's like, I don't understand. Like, the idea behind the blinders is basically, I've never played VR before, and I'm going to play this game. And because I've never played VR, I'm probably going to get motion sick. Oh, <laughs> that guy, he's going to get motion sick. Put on the handicap settings so he can't get motion sick. And that might be a thing if you're a first timer, it might, you know, help you tip your like dip your toes in. But if you've done mm-hmm. enough VR and you have those blinders on, it makes you sick because it's subjecting you to a field of view that isn't natural. 
It, it literally, it's like someone cut out one of your eyes. Like, it, it's very stupid. It, um, I mean, happily part of the patch, too, is that they added a, a chapter select tutorial so you could do in steps. They allowed you to skip it 100%. Um, so I'll probably play it again. Not not tonight. Not tonight. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Because um, I my quote-unquote rental ends on Tuesday. And I want to put another game into it. Maybe try to get an online match because I only played against robots so far. And, but yeah, no, 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 no. I, I highly doubt anyone that's listening that has a PR, PSVR uh, that has it cares because they already made their own opinion, but you have one or you think about getting one, pass on it for lots of reasons. One, there's never going to be another patch for it because Sony pulled the plug. And two, uh, yeah, no, don't do it. Don't do it. It, it. it, yeah, I haven't done all of the AAA stuff on PSVR, but out of the ones that I have... It is by far the one that was most uh, aggravating. Yeah. Um, so back to the news, though. Next week, the headlines are going to come a lot faster. Um, before we get to the Spider-Man, which you were talking about. Now, eh, fuck it. We'll start with Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> just get it yeah, over we'll with. Yeah, we'll just get it over with. Okay. Uh, before you even say what it is, what the fuck are they doing, man? Okay. So it was a... I don't know if they always intended to do this, but knowing Sony, they probably did. But it was a chain reaction that happened uh, Saturday. Wait. Friday. It happened Friday. Mm-hmm. So this is what happened. This is the timeline. Warner Brothers said, Hey, Aquaman's not coming out in October. It's going to be Xmas, guys. And the reason for that was, from last week, Avatar 2 got delayed, so there was a vacancy next Christmas. So it took that spot. And everyone's like, oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, no shit. It was kind of weird that Warner Brothers is going to be putting a big superhero movie in, out in October anyway. This makes a lot more sense. Especially since there's not, there isn't a Star Wars movie next Christmas because Han Solo is going to be in Memorial Day. They got a perfect spot. Right after that was announced, which it's fitting because its new day is going head to head with Sony's animated Spider-Man movie. Mm-hmm. Like, two hours later... Sony went, um, yeah, so we have a Venom movie, actually, that's coming out next October. So basically, with Aquaman disappearing, they went, we, we want that date now. And without anyone knowing anything about it, never hearing a fucking word about it, they all of a sudden have a Venom movie now set within the Spider-Man Homecoming universe. It was noted at the time of the press release when Sony and Marvel said we're teaming up for Spider-Man, that Sony still retained the rights to Mm -hmm. all of the other Spider-Man characters outside of Spidey himself and does not require oversight by Marvel into any of the decisions they make. Just in the same way they could do anything they wanted, both with the Andrew Garfield days and the Tobey Maguire days. So this is, I don't know, this is a, a weird step into an unknown direction. They have a writer's room, I would assume, uh, this is proof that they're working on their larger universe at hand. Um, it's just it's weird that they're going to be putting two Spider-Man movies out within two months from each other. And even more so that Venom failed in Spider-Man 3. They cast <laughs> fucking Topher Grace for some stupid reason and no one liked yeah. it. And unless there's Venom in Spider-Man Homecoming, which would be a real stupid decision, I'm not exactly sure how they can even put his movie out in the first place uh, unless it's an origin story and I read this thing, I I read this tweet which would be perfect Um, the only way that this film could even work is if they made Spider-Man the villain if you made a true anti-hero film, like literally Mm -hmm. you, Venom is an anti-hero he's not good or bad like the symbiote is bad, Eddie Brock is kind of good, he wants to be good but you know, it fucks with his head and he does questionable things, he's an anti-hero like Punisher is if you make him a true anti-hero, he's the main guy on screen, and yet Spider-Man is the bad guy. If he, if you kind of hate Spider-Man for stopping all the fun you're having, or something like that, um, but yeah, I don't know. I would assume if they're doing Venom this early, they're setting up Carnage. Maybe they're doing the whole uh, uh, fuck uh, Secret Wars storyline potentially in the Homecoming <laughs> sequel. Maybe this is them trying to do the Sinister Sticks again. Um, I don't think Venom was part of that setup with the Sinister Six that they originally planned with Amazing Spider-Man 2. That was more Sinister Six. That was going to be Rhino, all the animals. Rhino, Vulture, 
uh, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, uh, fucking Scorpion. Um, but even still, yeah, they're probably going to be going for that too again. So I wouldn't exactly count on uh, Andrew Garfield being gone. Like I said, if if they can pull off Homecoming and the animated movie next year and now especially Venom are successful, who knows, but it's this seems so fucking stupid. Yeah, I mean, you know, there is one pretty plausible theory that quickly got shut down that I heard, um, but, you know, Life, which is coming out next week, which is yeah. Sony's... Uh, it's possible that the alien in that is the symbiote, and it's Well, they Spider-Man. quickly dismissed that. No, they it's, were quick it's a good idea. No, I, I saw that too. It, it, like, it is it's, a cool connection perfect. where they would have just gone right under everyone's, or over everyone's head. Well, it and... could be one of those things where a studio shuts something down, they're like, no, 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 and then it comes out, and like, okay, yeah, we lied. Uh, which is definitely plausible because in terms you've seen the life that would be annoying. You've seen the life like, marketing, if it does right? That. Yeah, yeah it looks it. like I've they give the trailer, everything. Like it, it could be really cool, no. and it would make sense if they suddenly say, "Oh no, you know, it that's, looks it's, like it's, they it's like gave going, oh, 10 Cloverfield Lane is not a Cloverfield movie or some shit." You know, like it, some dumb shit like that. It's like, don't do that. It looks if, like when they people gave figure something out. Don't literally it. everything away in the trailer. Max Landis went off about this. Because it's one of those trailers where you see it and you're like, why would I watch the movie? I decide. Like, these scientists find this organism. They they play with it. It plays with them. It kills mm-hmm. everyone except uh, fucking one of the astronauts. And then it's going to go with him back to Earth. And it's maybe going to take over the planet. So, yeah, no. Imagine if that astronaut is Eddie Brock. And it instead of <laughs> killing everyone like it was originally, like it seemed, it was more like they were having a hosting connection problem and it attaches perfectly like that that would be brilliant it really would like it would piss a lot of people off that wanted an original sci-fi film mm-hmm. but if they're somehow able or maybe better yet if that is just a, a closing credits like uh like little like end credit sequence no that would work that that could totally work and i wouldn't be mad i mean i'm not gonna go see life but it would make me want to see it I think a lot of people Indeed. would actually want to see it too. Like if if it's embargoed until the Friday it comes out. It is right now, yeah. And I think it's uh, reviews should be coming out in a few days. Imagine though. if there aren't reviews or better yet in the same way that Deadpool um that teaser in the beginning of Logan wasn't attached to the critical screenings. If they do exact same thing with this film, you know how crazy the internet would go about this in a good way? Like I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, we'll as of right now, no. It's stupid. Because yeah. this animated movie might be good. The animated Spider-Man Miles Morales movie, yeah, it might be good. Like, Spider-Man is a perfect pick for animation. It's, it's supposed to have... Uh, f- who's attached to that again? Black Spider-Man. It was, um, hmm? It's a Black Spider-Man. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about the creative team, though. Um, oh, I forget. I think uh, yeah. Lord and Miller might be involved in some capacity. Uh, but yeah. it's it's someone who's who's done shit because of course because it's Sony. Or weren't the Russo brothers doing something? Um, I don't think so. They're, I can't no, remember. They're, they're yeah. doing something else. They're making that Chinese superhero film. Uh, well, yeah. they're no, they are Chinese. Production yeah, they have a company. Chinese production company and they're making a superhero yeah. film at the production company. Um, yeah, I don't. It's 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 just the stupidest news item. It, it really is <laughs> because. Think about it. Well, it's just like to come out of nowhere. It like came out that, of nowhere. To yeah. be less than two years from now, and there's nothing, no word it, on it at it all. It truly like, only was a news what item. What are the chances of this being delayed? If Aquaman hadn't got that push by two months, it probably wouldn't have got announced at all. Maybe not until Comic Con or at all. Like literally, <laughs> um, they just they they found an opening in a calendar. And maybe Homecoming has had really good test screenings, which I'm sure it has. And they went, oh, that's Strike When the Iron's Hot, guys. We've got a good synonym score on our hands. That we can't fail. It's sad. It's real sad. Yeah. Um, the real news item, though, that happened this week, the real story that people care about, and I wish I, we were talking about this a little earlier because I've, I've lost a lot of energy. Um, <laughs> Warner Brothers is looking to reboot both. slash expand slash reimagine The Matrix. Uh, this was the biggest thing oh, on the internet this week. Way bigger than Venom. Way bigger than the thing that's going to come up next. Um, I'm 100% okay with this. Uh, it might piss a lot of people off because the Wachowskis, 
the siblings or the starship or whatever they're called nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. They currently aren't attached in any capacity, but hey, that's what happens when you make a project for a major studio and you sign away the rights. Because, um, uh, not exactly a spoiler, but Agent Smith or Smiths are in the Lego Batman movie. So they're already, the Matrix are already in a way part of the Lego movie universe, as Lego Dimensions. Um, the sad thing about this is the rumor is going around that Michael B. Jordan might be the ne new Neo. I hope that's not the case at all. I hope there's no Neo at all. Um, but think about it this way. I tweeted about this. Mm -hmm. I saw The it. Matrix came out in 1999. Mm -hmm. It was written at least two or three years before that. The Wachowski brothers, as they were known then, were making a story about the internet in the worldview that they could only imagine. They took the mm -hmm. technology then and made it really interesting. They made a 100% unique original story about how scary See, technology is. That's what makes sci-fi compelling, though, is when you're being forward-thinking and you're just speculating but at they, that point. When you get close to that reality and they, you try no, to bring too no, no, much no. from That's that reality, saying. it can They, they were forward-thinking yeah. in the age of which they were actually set. Mm -hmm. If someone... You saw The Matrix when you were 9, right? Nine ten. Yeah. I saw it when I was, like, 8 or 9, okay? So when we saw it, that was the world that we lived in. However, mm -hmm. if someone was 8 or 9 right now, and they saw The Matrix for the first time, it's a super fucking dated movie. They don't have no, smartphones. Really. The internet isn't the no. internet. Amazon I've doesn't exist. I've seen it theatrically fairly recently. It still holds no, up. No, the story holds up. The visuals hold up. The movie holds up, The yeah. world and how the people interact with technology doesn't hold up at all no one uses a computer in that movie besides people in the cubicle and neo in his fucking house in the dark room they go mm -hmm. to a gothic underground club that's not even a subculture anymore in america that's moved on to australia like it is not the internet as we know it anymore i don't think an eight or nine year old would know that even but... still i'm not saying that but a lot of stuff would seem out of place for someone who's eight or nine now they would go from, for instance, with the tweet that I did, that's a piece of shit phone. Why is Neo like it? It doesn't even have a touchscreen. The iPhone changed yeah. the world as we know it, especially from how we look at technology. And I don't think necessarily, hey, yeah, The Matrix definitely needs a remake. However, at the same time, I don't think it would necessarily be a bad thing. I really do think in the way that digital worlds truly are a thing now that Warner Brothers would have a better idea about how to create a digital world about a world made digitally. I just especially... Yeah, but you're thinking about it from a world-building standpoint. Yeah. When you say shit like don't do the one, then you're basically I saying don't, do don't remake... Yeah, you're saying don't remake The Matrix. Like, it's okay to do something with that idea, yeah, but with they the idea. are talking about yeah, remaking no, see, I The think Matrix. They're talking that's about the retelling issue. that no, story. No, I, I don't want the story at all. I don't no, want the, Morpheus. Then don't I don't remake the movie. No, you Tell don't, a new you story don't with have, new Yeah, tech. you don't have to remake the movie. I'm against that. Um, you don't need Neo at all. We're tired of Jesus movies. Warner Brothers already has Superman. Okay, you already got one Messiah figure. Yeah, so just you don't, don't remake need the movie. Another you don't one. need it. Okay, you don't need two at the same time. Um, yeah, I don't want that. I don't it's, want. It's just brand recognition. If you do another one, that's it. I, I'm that's fine with that. Reason. It's been a long time since Warner Brothers milked the Matrix. Yeah, but then it's weird. You're saying don't. You're saying you're fine with it, but then you're saying don't remake essentially what the movie is, which is of course what they're gonna do. I'm 100 percent fine with them going back to the world, recreating literally the Matrix. That idea on paper is mm -hmm. brilliant. It's one of the best ideas we've ever had, especially in contemporary filmmaking. It's just great. Okay, with how virtual reality is set up currently, mind you, Warner Brothers is making the Ready Player One movie, so they're yeah. totally banking on virtual reality. Ready Player One is surely going to have a virtual reality marketing scheme. The Matrix are 100% going to have a VR marketing scheme. If there's been ever a movie, any an intellectual property that is perfect for VR, it is The Matrix. Because yeah. think about it this way. Having that tube that goes in the back of your neck isn't mm -hmm. necessary anymore because we have technology today, never mind you in the year 3000, that is good enough that you feel like you are literally within a world. You, instead of having that really cool farming image of all the babies like with the tubes in their arms and shit, you don't even need that. 
Just give them a VR it's headset. It's not about giving you the feel. It's about literally putting you there and making you believe but that you are you there. Can, a VR headset's not going to give you the sensations it, that you're there. It can... You get hit in VR, you're not going to feel the it. The real present day of the Matrix is a thousand years from now. I'm pretty sure that they could develop something a lot closer than in some way. It just... I don't know. I don't want to know the details yet. This well, is just also something... the idea of the Matrix is that those are not like naturally bred humans. Yeah, that know? too. It's their they're barcodes. They're parts of data as well. Yeah. Um, no, but so it, it's something that's really out there. I, I'm okay. Like I said, Lego Batman has Agent Smith in it. You know, like it has a lot of the properties in the way the Lego Movie does. Like obviously you have the mm-hmm. Justice League people. Um, but you have like fucking the Eye of Sauron or uh, Eye of Mordor or whatever. Like you, you have uh, fucking um, Harry Potter characters. Like they really took their Warner Brothers intellectual properties and used them, not entirely wisely, but they went there. Um, and what was notable about Agent Smith making an appearance was that it's the first time an R-rated entry from their intellectual property warehouse was used in the Lego universe. So that was already telling to a certain point that this news isn't exactly surprising because that was the first time that they even used that intellectual property. Um, it's like 2007? They made that like Path of Neo video game. They made three Matrix video games. They even made an MMO. They made Enter the Matrix, they made the Path of Neo, and then they made the Matrix Online. That they they did the Animatrix. They they did a comic mm-hmm. book run. They did yeah. they did a lot of shit, and they left it alone for about a decade. That's pretty good. Like, look at what Disney's doing currently. Like, maybe Disney's to blame. Like, Warner Brothers isn't content with, oh yeah, we made those Hobbit movies, and then we made the lot the. Lord of the Rings movies. Oh yeah, we got we got Godzilla. Well, it's not, it's we just, just did Disney. King it's, Kong. It's a, like it's kind of it's a bit of just the entire uh, d- just Hollywood in general right now. It's just some are more successful than others, so they're going to get more credit at being successful at it. I just I'm I don't want like I said I don't want them to revisit this world. But if there's ever been a world that deserves a revisiting. I think it's this one. Like I, I just think you should create something new with it. Yeah, that's no, all. that's what like, I'm saying too. Like I more, don't. Yeah, you, you don't I, need to attach a brand name don't, to it. That's... I don't want Neo. Like it, it would be. Don't even show fucking Keanu Reeves. Here's an idea. Everyone's always kind of wondered what happened in the Matrix at the very end of the Matrix trilogy. They set it up for mm-hmm. a next installment. Make a new installment. You don't need the Wachowskis for that. They press the reset button on the Matrix. How brilliant would it be if they had a new trilogy set within that reset universe? He could do it. It'd be really easy. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, old habits die hard. Maybe make the story that the the robots went back on their word and they enslaved humans again. They started farming them again, okay? <laughs> um, it just, I... I am too enticed by the idea of what we have today how important not just internet but technology is to every single living breathing human in the first world that the world building from a almost 20 year old movie when it's entirely about technology and what it means to us Mm -hmm. doesn't stand up anymore in the way that technology actually means to us it feels dated it feels like a product of the 90s in a good way and also, The Matrix Reloaded and the fucking Matrix Revolutions aren't good movies. And, you know, it's... I disagree They're not good that. movies. <laughs> they're disagree. convoluted they're, as shit. They might shit. be bloated they're and have way too much bloated. on their mind, but they're really fucking ambitious, and I respect that. Any movie where a character dies halfway through the franchise and has to be recast kind of gets a big check minus. And Warner Brothers has the, okay, two of those. The, but you know that that was out of their hands. Of course it was out of their hands. And you the know, excuse yeah, that they on. wrote into the script to explain it... it was pretty clever. No. It worked. Yeah, no, no, it worked. <laughs> no. I thought it worked for a system that you do not understand that can kind of pull shit out of its own ass. Yeah, they did it in a way that was actually completely they plausible. Pulled it out of their own ass. Um, but yeah. like, look at it this way. After, but I could, I could buy into after it based on that logic. After Warner's did Jupiter Sending, right? Yeah, yeah, after they... No, they their home has been yeah. Warner Brothers all the way through. After the the money that Jupiter didn't make, it it's kind of makes sense that they wouldn't want to invite them back. They don't need them. 
And to be honest, it probably they're doing fine with Sense Eight. That was a big hit. That's different. That's Netflix. Yeah, I'm just saying they're doing fine. Um, sort of. Eh, not really. They don't like write or direct that shit. They, I think they just wrote the pilot. Uh, I still haven't seen it. I know the second. They I know the second it. season's coming out, but they, like they're not quite yeah. in jail. But they're not going to do another tent pull for uh, quite some time, probably. Um, no, I want this movie. Whatever it is, as long as it's not another The Matrix. You don't remake perfect movies. Chances are pretty low of that happening. Warner Brothers are the king of the reboot. They've done it over and over again. Batman Begins is the pinnacle of why a reboot works, okay? Yeah. By the way, they both directed 11 episodes of Sensei. Did they direct them? A lot oh, of okay, them, yeah. I st- But there's other directors. Tom Tickfer and James McTeague, who they've worked with before. Yeah, I, yeah. Wanna, I still want to check that show out. So, yeah, it, it's it's pretty maybe much I'll, Maybe I'll watch it before uh, the second season comes out later this year. Um, but, I no, like, you don't remake a perfect movie. Warner Brothers knows that. They haven't, like, they're smart enough with their intellectual properties that they could make, you know, like an HBO Matrix show while making mm-hmm. their tent fall movies every year or two within the universe. Maybe do not the Animatrix, but something like that in CG animation and put that on the big screen. The franchise is a proven money getter. People are going to go see this movie regardless. Just get go ballsy. I, I want to want to see it. Because I'm already intrigued. And I think the initial response is ludicrous. And the real reason well, it's, is... It's a remake. Well, Those are always going to get flack it, with her now. It's not called a remake yet. The, this is people reporting on what someone told them who knows someone that was in a stockholder meeting. This is not a press release. This is a rumor on a rumor. As far as we know, mm-hmm. this is a leak intentionally by Warner Brothers to see if they should make another movie. And so far, the the consensus is no. Don't fucking do it. What's crazy about this Matrix news is it overshadowed, overshadowed the real remake news that mattered. The thing that we're, we care about because it's our next set to cinema, The Fly is getting a remake <laughs> at Fox. Fox is making a remake to one of their remakes. They're remaking I'll let probably you the best remake Tuesday. they've ever made at their studio. Which is crazy. With someone, I mean, you mind know, you, who is... Universal sort of did it, because they did a remake or slash prequel of The Thing, and look at how well that did. It didn't. It didn't do no. well at all. The no. thing, too, here... Creatively and This is the craziest well. thing about this remake. It's going to be directed by someone who is not a proven talent. It's going to be J.D. Dillard. Same thing with The Thing. No. Cronenberg was proven by that time. He had been making movies... No, no The Thing. Oh, The Thing. The thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, who directed that? Uh, well, John Carpenter did no, no, the no, first I mean, remake. The other one, the, I don't The same titled that. Mary Elizabeth Winstead film. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, this is J.D. Dillard, the guy who's no name. Uh, if you didn't go to Sundance last year, you don't know his name, but he's the guy that directed that slight movie, the the Blumhouse flick about uh, sleight of hand magic, and it's a thriller. It's coming out April 28th. I want to see it. I'm intrigued just because magic's never on the big screen besides those Now You See Me movies. Um, he has another movie that's in production right now, also at Blumhouse, called Sweetheart. So I, I guess Slate comes out, or Slight, then he's working on Sweetheart, and then maybe mm-hmm. he's making this flaw movie. I just don't want it to exist. Uh, when's the last time Fox made a good horror film? Besides like Alien? Cure to Wellness? No, good. Like, people... Cure uh, to Wellness, Universal yeah. acclaim, like, it's good. Like... Maybe Alien Covenant, they got cocky. We'll see how that turns out, because they're really going for horror on that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't think of, besides the Alien franchise, and those are hit or miss, I can't think of the last time they had, like, a good genre film, like a horror film. All they make is the Apes movies and the X-Men movies nowadays. Like, why would they even want to make this and like that's that's the beauty behind it the fact that this news came out the same news day as the venom news and the matrix news was that it got piled on so big that no one gave a shit besides me <laughs> i don't know maybe it could be good i mean, I, yeah, I, 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 I i still i can't even offer yeah, a passion you haven't seen the movies yeah. that in general though i'm just kind of like like they made 
The yeah, Fly. Well, I don't, I don't know. know if the Vincent Price movie was at Fox. Uh, probably was. And they made that. Then they made the Cronenberg movie. And they weren't satisfied with that, so they made a sequel to the Cronenberg movie without him. And now they're making a remake. Or I would more accurately say a reboot. Because nothing is made anymore as a one-off. It's always to start something else. It's like, watch the fly be part of the alien universe. It's like a xenomorph is going to show up. Like, oh yeah, and Sorry, I totally forgot about this, but um, I, I just realized that 28 Days Later, that's technically a Fox film. Okay, well, 28 Weeks Later wasn't good, and 28... Days. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying, 28 Weeks Later wasn't good, and 28 Days Later yes, it was. was... Like it. 28 Weeks Later is good. Was that 2004? 2003? 2007. No, the first one. 2002. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah. We're talking about 15 years now. <laughs> yeah, it's good, man. Eh. Holy sh! Poltergeist is a Fox film. Okay, there you go. That's proof the that they shouldn't. That's, a Fox that's film? proof that they shouldn't do remakes. No one saw that. I didn't see it, and I could have saw it for free. I said no. I completely forgot that. I skipped existed, seeing man. it in 3D, and you know how much I love 3D. I said no. Wow, yeah. I'm seeing the original in 70mm, too. Yeah, Fox shouldn't be remaking shit. It. It's a mistake. The final thing in the show, though, um, it, it should have been a teaser. It got misplaced. Uh, Netflix is going to be adding a skip credit sequence button, which is a piece of shit. Uh, <sighs> better than that, they're abandoning the star system, probably, for thumbs up and down. And this is how it gets even more ludicrous. you got to stack it on. Uh, it looks like they may adopt pan and scan like functionality for mobile devices. You know what? A lot of people are going to be happy. I know a lot of people are going to be happy. As much as it sucks to say, but yeah, that makes sense that they're doing that just for their consumers to be happy. It doesn't make sense because sure it does. I don't. It's terrible I wonder for artistry, if, but people are going to be so happy. Is about there that. a piece of the contract when a movie is sold or licensed to Netflix that says Netflix holds the discretion? to cut and paste and, and change the aspect ratio of the features. Yeah, let me ask you this. When you uh, watched Apocalypse on HBO uh, Go, what was the ratio? The real ratio. They don't change shit. Are you sure? No, because they do. I had black they, bars. They do it so that... Uh, were there black bars at yeah. the top and bottom? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, no, like there are movies where they do it so that's in the 16 by 9 and they will crop it well, regardless see, what it that's is. That's the Sometimes thing. That's what's weird. I, I didn't watch Apocalypse Go... Uh, Apocalypse... X Men Apocalypse on HBO Go because I was having streaming problems. My bandwidth was having issues. On mm-hmm. my PS4, when I was watching it in app, there weren't black bars. It was cropped. When I watched it on demand on my satellite, it was a proper aspect ratio. But that's a difference. You know, that's like cutting off like a sliver. It's not pan and scan, it's not the inverse. This news item isn't about people that hold their phone. And they're looking at it in a 16 by 9 ratio where they can easily convert it. This is meant for people that hold their phone or their tablet vertically and they want probably to watch it the same way they watch Instagram Live and Snapchat videos. What? Yeah, trust me. That's okay, that's what that, this that means. Is dumb. No, no, it's yeah. not. No, we're talking about no, this is this that's is great. We, we're talking about this is great. This makes sense for you mobile no, users. No, no, I, I completely flip flopped on this one. That is, uh, who frames shots that way? Uh, no one. But like, that's I've what seen trust them me. That's put trailers in that ratio for shit on Twitter. It never. No, it's works. horrible. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it on Instagram. It's real yeah. bad. When a movie gets a big trailer now and it's released, it's on Instagram in that horrible one by one ratio. It's stupid. And trust me, that's exactly what this means. It means that you're going to be able to watch it that way. Because people can hold their phone with one hand that way. The other way, you have to hold it with two hands. You don't like doing that for some no, reason. you don't. You kind of do. No, you don't. You can just hold it with one. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. If you're on a bus and you're... Use your palms. No, if you're on a bus and you're holding it that way, you're going to drop your phone. You have fingers. They're, no. Uh, yes. Trust me, this is meant for landscape. This is not landscape. This is meant for portrait mode. This is the fucking hot dog I still mode. read my articles sideways just so that my I eyes don't. can get more space to breathe instead Fuck, of no. being My phone's cramped. never sideways unless I'm watching a video. That's the I I read articles. If I'm not that taking a picture, just, it's easier to read left to right that way with its wider. If I'm not on YouTube or I'm not on um uh what you call it? What was I going to say? If I'm taking a picture, looking at pictures or I'm watching a video, I don't hold my phone that way ever. I, yeah, I I do generally like always unless it's for the main menu screen. I mean, yeah, my eyes are side to side; they're not top to bottom, you guys. Yeah, but scrolling up and down when your phone is in that that 
that landscape yeah, doesn't it's work. It's not hard at all. It, it doesn't make as much sense. It, it it it's it's harder. You have a PSP. You know, it's it's not that's that hard different. to navigate something like that's that. That's a different. That's a a phone's no, lightweight enough that I can a, hold it and operate for it. For one, one hand. thing, the PSP was designed for the ergonomics of two hand controlled. Number one, it has hand grips on the back for that. It has triggers on the corners so your fingers will sit there naturally. It was invented mm-hmm. with two hands in mind. It's completely different. A phone is not meant for two hands. In the same way that if you've ever tried typing on a keyboard on a smartphone, even if you have a really large screen, it's not accurate. And the reason it's not accurate is because it doesn't work in the same way. Typing on a screen isn't perfect any way you cut it. But no, I mean that's one thing where I do think actually Apple has the upper hand on everybody because their touch screens are a lot smoother. It's it's not the touch screen. They all use the same shit. That that that's the code. No, it's it's just way easier and more fluid when you touch the buttons and just the reaction time works better. No, I it that's been my experience. I don't know. Uh that's the show though. Uh, that was two cents. We might not be back next week. <laughs> it's definitely going to be shorter next week. Um mm. maybe 12 episodes left, guys. Oh my god, it's like 3 a.m. Yeah, tired. Yeah. So, yeah. Have a good one. Dollarviews.net. Like us, favorite, whatever, subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your family. Tell the people that have money. We want to get paid. Have a good one. See you next week. <laughs>